introduce to you all, you know, uh, Jim Hamburger and Sally. Uh, we met them when we were living in Florida, uh, I would say 12 years ago, in uh, was close to Orlando. And my good friend, uh, Pedro Orta, introduced us to, you know, and I remember to this day, the place was packed, completely packed. There was not a seat available, you know, and Lucy would not speak that much English by that time. So I would pop in and pop out, and Lucy would say, what, what is he talking about? And I say, well, it's about country living and about family and, and, and other things. And out of the blue, Jim stopped the presentation and he said, I want to introduce to you my wife, Sally, my queen. You know, and there comes Sally walking with a beautiful smile on her face. And Jim stops everything. He looks to Sally and they kiss each other. So I went off. I spoke with my wife, Lucy. See, this guy is crazy. Oh, he, he's doing it again. He's doing it again. <laughs> this guy is crazy. He stopped. How come a speaker stop everything to kiss his wife in front of a multitude of people? And then uh, we didn't have kids by then. And then a few years later, we start to go to Campo Colacqua uh, mm -hmm. to see your presentation. And you did the same again. Mm -hmm. you, you introduced Sally. And that really stuck in my mind, you know. And now I appreciate that so much because in the madness of the days that we have at work or with the kids, I always try to stop for a few minutes and, and, and kiss my, my queen here, you know, because I learned that from you. So uh, thank you very much for that. Thanks so much for the country leaving. And so again, guys, you know, I, I don't want to be too long, but again, Jim Homberger here, uh, a gentleman, as the Irish say, you know, a gentleman to take us to give time to spread this wonderful word. You know, there's so many people looking for the country message. There's so many people looking to be a better husband, to be a better parent, to be a better brother or sister in church, you know? And this gentleman and his wife, in my eyes, are the trailblazers for this movement. You know, there's so many people. There's people from Spain, the group here. There's people from Brazil, New Zealand, Ireland, UK, Latvia, uh, Lithuania. Lithuania, you know, uh, Pedro Art to say he was going to join. So we may see Pedro here in a few minutes, Jim, you know, so uh, just to let you know. So, Jim, if you want to start with a word of prayer and jump into the message, the time is yours. People from Portugal, too. Oh, yeah, some people from Portugal as well. My wife yeah. is seeing you. Sorry. Very. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to all you people. Let's just have a word of prayer. We we always want to make sure we're under God, not under man. So we ask God to come into the speaker's heart, obviously. All I am is a mailman. I'm not an important person. I'm just a person that delivers a message from God. The important person is that you get connected with God. So let's, let's ask for that connection now. Father in heaven, we are thankful that we can bring so many people together from so many different countries and all speak and search for the same thing, that security and safety that there is in connecting with you. May we understand that country living isn't the solution. It's merely an aid to our spiritual and our social security. And we wanna use as many aids as we can to come closer to you in these end times. Now bless this meeting, bless me with your spirit, open the people's hearts and minds and eyes and understanding their consciences so that they can know what you are saying to them specifically. We thank you for your presence with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you've already met my beautiful wife. <laughs> She's my queen. And uh, I can tell you, we're 72 years old, by the way. We're very much uh, in love today. We're not just, we don't just love each other. We're actually in love today because of the principles that we'll be sharing with you. So many couples at our age are just coexisting or getting along and they've lost that spark of life. God doesn't want you to lose that. So let's talk about an aid that will help every one of us if we use it correctly. And I, and I mean that word, if we use it correctly, uh, can enhance our Christian life and experience with God and in our uh, associations, in our marriage, and in our families, and with our church, and then to the world. So, okay, see in a little bit. She's just going to sit down in the living room here, in case I need her. Let me just give you a very quick overview of Jim Holmberger and Sally Holmberger first. I was born into a, a Roman Catholic mother and a Lutheran father. I was sent to nine years of Catholic uh, schooling. 
Uh, then I went to public high school. That's where I met my queen, Sally. She met her in chemistry class. Her last name was Hughes. My last name is Hohenberger. She sat right behind me. That hooked us up. We started dating and we got married when we were 23 years old. Uh, I was born a very simple person. I didn't have a great mind. I didn't have any great talents. Uh, I was a hard worker. That was probably my greatest gift. And uh, because of that, I always wanted to be a famous person. I wanted to make a lot of money and have a big home and have lots of cars. And so after I married my queen, Sally, I stopped pursuing her and I pursued worldly success. And that created a lot of tension in our marriage. And I, I achieved a lot of very good income. And in that process, I owned an insurance agency and I sold some insurance to a Seventh-day Adventist dentist. And uh, he didn't want to buy any life insurance because he felt that the Lord was going to return <laughs> before he could use it. I laughed at him. I still remember today because <laughs> I'd never heard anything so stupid in all my life at that particular point in my life. I never opened the Bible in my life at that point. I was 30 some years old. And he invited me to his house. He was the strangest man I ever met because when I went into his home with my wife, the crowd I hung with he gave me a bottle of beer. So she came in the house. There was no beer. There's no Pepsi. There was no chocolate. There was nothing. I thought, this guy is weird. And uh, after sitting in the living room talking, he said, let's go in the dining room. We went to the dining room and he says, excuse me, I got to get something. I thought he's going to go get my bottle of beer. <laughs> he comes walking around the corner and he's got, I'll never forget it. He had four Bibles under his arm. I count them one, two, three, four. I thought, this guy's a nut. I'm going to get out of here. I looked at my watch. It was 633. And we left that night at 1130 at night. And this guy was a scholar on Daniel and Revelation. And he opened up. He asked me to open the Bible of Daniel. I said, what's Daniel? He says, that's in the Old Testament. I said, what's the Old Testament? <laughs> And uh, he opened up the Daniel and uh, took me through the dream, the vision that Daniel had of the world. And I never heard anything so profound in my entire life. We studied for one and a half years with them, joined the Adventist church. And there's, there was three major pivotal points in my life. One was when I accepted the Bible in my early 30s as the sole authority over my life. That was a major pivotal point for me. And that's very important because what we're going to talk about today comes from God's word. The second major pivotal point in my life was when I joined the Seventh-day Adventist church. I would not be alive today if it wasn't for the Seventh-day Adventist message. I was born to a family of five. I was the middle child. My older brother died of uh, self-induced lifestyle changes that uh, at 66, he died of uh, smoking uh, emphysema. My sister died of pancreatic cancer at 64. My kid brother died at 45 from uh, lifestyle changes. My only remaining sibling can barely walk across the living room. I'm 72 years old because of the message of the Seventh-day Adventist health message. I climb mountains. I hike twice a week, uh, 10, 15 miles, 3,000 feet of elevation because not because I'm great, but because of the message that God has delivered to us as a people. If we would take that message seriously, it only enhances our life. And so the third major pivotal point was when we moved to the wilderness. So bringing you up to date, I began to pursue a worldly lifestyle, became successful, not because I was great, just because I'm a very focused person and I really do apply myself. In that process, I met the Seventh-day Adventist dentist. He introduced me to the scriptures. We became Seventh-day Adventists. And at that particular point, we're 34 years old. So I'm bringing you up to age 34 now. We, at that time, we were living in the country. We had 40 acres. We had a 3,000 square foot, all log cedar home. I had five vehicles very successful in my business, making lots of money. Uh, I became the head elder of the Appleton Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, shared my faith. Over a dozen people were baptized into the Appleton Seventh-day Adventist Church as a result of that. That's why they made me head elder and a Sabbath school teacher. My wife was a deaconess and a uh, 
Uh, she taught the teens. We were in a good standing in the community and we had a great social life, families around us, but that's the outward veneer of Jim and Sally. That's what you would have seen from an outward package if you just saw us in the church. We were on the treadmill of life and that treadmill was tearing at the fabric of our marriage. If you could have got into our home behind closed doors, I had a terrible temper, just a terrible temper. My wife had insecurities. If you would have seen the, the interior of our life, not the exterior, but the interior of our life, our marriage wasn't in good shape. Our family wasn't. We were just raising up our two young sons. And our spiritual lives, even though I was the head elder of the church, and I knew the biblical doctrines, it was all head knowledge. It wasn't an internal experience with God. We were, we were lacking that. I could not have explained to you how to live by faith. I could not explain to you but what daily grace was. So because of that, uh, we started asking ourselves some very serious questions, which I'm hoping that you'll ask some serious questions of yourselves today too. We said, said to ourselves, are we living as God would have us to live? And when I went back to the Bible, when I told you the Bible had the sole authority in my life, and I opened it up to the book Genesis, I saw that God put man in the Garden of Eden, a simple, quiet life. And I said, well, God doesn't make mistakes. Maybe we should go back to God's original plan. So we asked ourselves, Lord, what do you want us to do? That's Acts 9, 6, by the way. That's what every one of you should be asking yourself. What does God want you to do? Not what he asked Jim and Sally to do, but what is God's plan for your life, for your marriage, for your family? Those are very serious questions to ask. So many of us just get on the, uh, into the group think because everybody in our church is doing it this way. <laughs> Maybe we should do it this way. And we should not be following that necessarily. We should be saying, Lord, what are you asking of us? And that's what Sal and I did that was very different. What was God's preferred lifestyle for Jim and Sally? We were spending most of our time in the peripheral of life. Uh, after we became uh, Adventists and Bible believers, we got rid of all the, the bad stuff in our life, but we were at the level of good not at the level of better and best. And so you can spend all your life on good things, nothing wrong with them, but you never really get to the best because good steals the best. So we had almost no time for what I would call the Enoch walk. Enoch was my hero when I first started studying the Bible. I just admired that man, even though not much is said about him, but I had no time to find that walk, that Enoch. It was some that people talk about, but nobody really experiences. Uh, we had no time for each other. We were so busy at church board meetings and giving Bible studies and preparing to teach a Sab school and give a, a sermon and working with other couples. We spent very little time with each other now. It was tearing our marriage apart. And we had very little time for our two sons. It's, I mean, we'd feed them, we'd stick them in bed, we'd give them a hug and a kiss, but we didn't really have that interaction that God designs for all of us to have with their family's mem members. So we said, what is God's prescription for Jim and Sally Honberger? And this is what we came up with. And I actually wrote it down. It says, the more nearly we come into harmony with God's original plan, the more favorable would it be to our spiritual walk with God, to our marriage, and to a connected family. That was That was our our prescription for us. People thought we were nuts. <laughs> they, thought, they thought we were we were crazy that you can't do that, Jim. You, 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 can't, you can't go back to a Garden of Eden lifestyle, but we can do that as much as possible within the realms of God's grace working in our life. So we would follow the promise in Matthew 11, 28, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That was the promise that Sal and I hung on to, that we would come unto God and we could not lose if we really, really, really connected with God. Not just the church, not just the knowledge of the scriptures, not just read the desire of ages of the great controversy, great books, but 
God, because everything, the Bible, the church, the spirit of prophecy are, are all stepping stones only to connect you to God, not to itself. And we were connected to the lower levels, if you would, and we weren't allowing them to connect us to God himself. So we had a form of godliness, but we didn't know the abiding experience spoken of in Psalms 91. It's one of my, in, in Psalms, it's my favorite chapter. It talks about the secret place. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. I could have read that to you, but I, I didn't know what the secret place was. I didn't know how to dwell in it either. It says, he that abideth in the shadow of the Almighty, that God is my refuge and my fortress, my strength. Well, that's beautiful stuff. And I could, I could pass a test, uh, a written test on that, but the experience was lacking. And it's lacking in the church today, too. We're in trouble. The Christian churches are in trouble. The world is taking over. And I hold the church responsible. The church is supposed to be the conscience for the nation and the world. And we're not living as, as we ought to live. So we did something very radical that people thought. We sold our home. We sold a thriving business. Uh, we sold all my five vehicles. We sold all our possessions including that stupid TV set. And we canceled all my newspaper subscriptions, all my magazine subscriptions. We said goodbye to our relatives. We said goodbye to our friends. We said goodbye to our church. And we headed not for the country. We were already living in the country, remember, but we're living a city lifestyle in the country. It doesn't work. So we moved to the wilderness of Montana, 50 miles up a gravel road. 50 miles from power. Uh, we were boarding Glacier National Park. We we're 10 miles south of the Canadian border. And in that 50 miles, there's only 75 people that live. So it's a very remote, very secluded wilderness area. And what was our goal? Solomon, the wisest man in the world says, all is vanity, but oneness with God book Ecclesiastes, if you read it. Our goal was that oneness with God, that we, we weren't seeing. We weren't seeing it in our friends. We didn't see it in, in our lives. We weren't seeing it in our church. We weren't seeing it in other churches. We were seeing religion, but we weren't seeing that real close, intimate walk with God that Enoch had, John the Baptist had, Paul had after he was knocked off his high horse and became Paul. So we intended that to live as God intended man to live, we'd live a quiet, simple life amidst the splendor of his creation. We'd raise our two sons to, to love righteousness, to learn how to walk with their God, and to honor and respect their parents. And, and, and people, my, my family, my friends, our church told us we were crazy, were we? That was 38 years ago, by the way. Were we crazy? We're 34 years young at the time. We decided we would shelter our two boys, Matthew and Andrew. And let me show you a picture of them if I can. I hope this can. These were our two boys after they left home. So when, just before they got married, these were our two sons, if you could see them. Matthew, there's. Uh, on my side, and Andrew is on Sally's side, and they are today the 43 and 41 years old. They're very successful in their businesses. Very successful, by the way. Matthew is the head elder of the largest church in Montana, Adventist Church. Uh, very responsible young man. Andrew is the elder of a, probably the most conservative church in all of Montana. And uh, they have very, they're, they're spiritual leaders today. And people told us that our boys would become dysfunctional. They would be unsocialized. You, you can't remove them from their peer group. You can't remove them from their Sabbath school classes. You're just going to take them in the wilderness. And they, they said that our boys would be misfits in the world. <laughs> well, I want you to know that didn't happen. So that's a picture of them. This is the home that we lived in uh, up there. Now, we didn't, 
move into that home right away. That's our log home, 960 square feet. Uh, we put all our rock work around it. We put in the porches. We put in the, uh, we stained the house. We put on a new roof. We put in the cedar shingles up on the uh, second floor up there. So that's the log home. So you get a little better feel. So when we moved up there, that's where we were living. We built a uh, greenhouse. So Sally and I cut down, our boys were only age four and six when we moved there. So we cut down all the trees and we milled that lumber. And the reason we built the greenhouse, you can see the greenhouse there and you can see we had a outhouse there too. You'll find out why that was important. And I'm just trying to give you a feel for the setting that we're in. These were the mountains. That's my front yard. If you, if you look here, this is my front yard right here. And these are the glacier, uh, Rocky Mountains of Glacier National Park. So that'll give you a little feel uh, to help you enter in a little bit more with where we found ourselves at age 34. So our, our model was we would give them the best and we would guard them from all the rest. That was our model still is today for our grandchildren. We would give our children not good, not better. In fact, we got rid of all the good in our life. We got rid of all the better in our life. We would only give them the best. And people thought we'd gone off the rocker. <laughs> well, we didn't think we had. So we cut off every influence of corrupting nature. Every influence we cut off of corrupting nature. We would break up every habit that would hold them to their later life. And when they left home, our goal was when they got married, they would have no habit that they would have to wrestle with, that we would have given them the power of God in their life so that there would be no habit that they would have to break after they left our house. That was our main purpose in country living. Were we crazy? Were we fanatical? Were we lunatics? In trying to make God their constant companion? I'll let you judge that for yourself. So we, we had five acres. We were boarded by the uh, US Forest Service. We had a year round creek that came through the property. We had a hundred gallon a minute uh, spring up above us. I told you we had the, I showed you the greenhouse. We had all or gardens. The reason we had the greenhouse because where we live had such a cold climate that if you're going to raise tomatoes and things of that nature, they had to be greenhoused. That's why we built the greenhouse. So we were living in probably the most vitalizing air and water on earth where we were at. Our companions were deer, elk, moose, grizzly bear, black bear, mountain lions. Those were our companions. That's what we raised our boys with. In fact, we had uh, a pet bear. Uh, we had pet deer. I, didn't, I hadn't planned on showing you this, but uh, here's, a, here's a picture of our pet bear, if you will. Uh, he was wild, but uh, mother died and we adopted him. Just like we adopted, uh, and you can see Sally's feeding him in the picture. There's a picture of uh, our uh, grizzly bear in our front yard, moose. These are all right in our yard. And our yard became a sanctuary for the wildlife around us. And uh, we raised that, our boys in that environment. So after we arrived, everything went wrong. My wife got double pneumonia. She perforated her left eardrum. She broke her foot twice. Uh, she broke her finger in a ringer washing machine. We didn't have a washing machine that was working at the time. We went down to a neighbor and they had an old ringer washing machine and she's putting the clothes through and she, her fingers got caught in it and she broke her finger. We had no health insurance. I came down with pneumonia. Our water source, our creek froze up in the winter. So we were without water. It left us with uh, uh, a serious septic problem. Our septic tank froze up as a result of that. That's why that picture of that outhouse you saw was, was very important for us. Our propane tank blew up. 
We lost 500 gallons of propane tank when we could least afford it. And I had mechanical problems with the truck. So everything, everything started going wrong. <laughs> Not a good picture, was it? You know, if the devil can't destroy you by having you on the treadmill of life, and you know, most Christians today are on the treadmill of life. They really are. Even my two sons are wrestling with that. They're, they're so successful. They're trying to control their success. And that treadmill is tearing at the fabrics of their marriages and their, and their family lives right now. And we've been talking about it. I mean, they've achieved, they're fully out of debt, they have beautiful country properties, have very successful businesses, very active in their church, but they're in the same place that I was when we moved out. They're, they're, they're overly successful. And that can tear at the treadmill of your life. But we had broken from that. Praise God. All those distractions, all that lesser living, if you will. And now the devil would try to break us with discouragement. It's a tool that he uses very effectively. He tries to discourage you in your Christian walk, in your life, in your marriage, in your church life. So we're told from God's word that trials are his workmen. They, they burn the dross out of us and they only purify our gold. And these trials, what they did for us, actually, they drove us to God. We didn't have much money when we moved up there. Uh, we, had, uh, we were out of debt. We had $18,000 left. We divided that in three, said we'd live on $6,000 a year for three years until we tried to find this deeper walk with God. So we didn't have much money left when we were done with it. But this, this is good because so many of us, the people that have failed in country living the most have been the people that have had the most money. And I'm gonna talk about this in the second part, but when we rely upon anything but God, it has to fail us. And so our total safety and our total security with all these trials put us right down to just trusting in God daily. And that's a good place to be. And that's where we're coming to in this world pretty soon. So, so God brought us through that trial. We found that. We found in Colossians 2.10, it says, you are complete in God. And when we found God in real living and brought it into our marriage and brought it into our families, we had completeness. And people felt sorry for us because we didn't have a TV set. We were, we were uh, 65 miles from the nearest church, you know, so going to church down a gravel road wasn't really uh, uh, in the works for us, but God was in the works for us. And all that dropping off of all that good stuff, if you will, only centered us in the best, which was a real living experience in God. So there was good medicine for us to go through this. At the time we moved there, people, we were leaders in our church and they, everybody thought that uh, we were born again and we were converted, but we really weren't, to be honest with you. I couldn't even told you what a born again Christian was even though I've been in the church for four years and brought a dozen people into the church. Born again person is a person has a new life living in them. It's not the old Jim Hornberger. It's Jim Hornberger subjecting himself in faith to God's grace every day, allowing God to come into Jim Hornberger and work in and through him so that I would filter my words before I would speak them to my wife or children. I would filter my actions. I would filter my thoughts. That's a born again Christian. I had biblical knowledge, which is very good. I had a good standing in the church, which is very good, but that doesn't mean uh, you're on home plate. That's only first base. If you're playing baseball, that's first base or second base. And I had a first or second base religion. I didn't have a home plate religion. So I was really a nominal Christian at that point in a laodicean condition, and I didn't know my true condition. I was a foolish virgin, and I thought I was a wise virgin. The whole church told me I was a wise virgin, but I wasn't. Uh, looking back on it, I see. So a lot of time with God finally connected us 
to the one power that we all need. And that's Jesus Christ. And that's what Moses found. It took him 40 years for Moses in the wilderness. John the Baptist was in the wilderness. Jesus lived 30 quiet years in uh, uh, his remote location. So did the apostle Paul when he was Saul knocked off his high horse. He was sent to the wilderness of Damascus for three years. So when I looked at all this, I thought, why? Why, why, why all this intense time with God? Uh, because we need it. So I found how to live by faith and a daily walk with God. And my temper, that German temper that, you know, I'd gone to six pastors and asked them, I said, Pastor, can you tell me how to overcome my temper? I, I've given up my alcohol. I've given up my cigarettes. I've given up uh, all these things when I became a, a, an Adventist, but I can't give up this temper of mine. And, you know, I went to six pastors and then none of them had a solution for me. I'm not a practical solution. And I said, what's wrong? I mean, I've got all this biblical knowledge. I've got all this lifestyle. I'm a vegan now. <laughs> and I, I can tell you who the beast over the ocean is and the seven hills, uh, 666. But I can't deal with the beast in my own heart. Well, why, why is that? Because you are really who you are behind closed doors. You, you're not who you are when you go to church with the Bible on your, your hand and you're you're, you're looking your best. You, you are who you are behind closed doors. So if we could play a video of you last week in your home life with your spouse, with your children, would you want us to play that video as the sermon in your church next Sabbath? Because that's who you really are. And I could have said, I would have told you, no, I don't want you to play that video, even though it was the head elder. So I had to find something even further. I had to go deeper. And that's what I'm saying to you. I'm not telling you to give up your biblical knowledge or your church membership or anything of that, that nature. I'm asking you to search your heart before God and ask him if you have the real thing, if you have the real experience. And your marriage is a testimony of that. And your children are a byproduct of that. That's what tells you what you are. So we're 72 years young. Today, we have a marriage that's absolutely irresistible. And I, I don't tell you that to brag or anything. I tell you that as the fruit of what we went searching for 38 years ago. Our two sons uh, are the spiritual leaders of their churches. They're strong men today. So what we did in, in our church thought we were crazy to do it, actually produced the fruit we wanted. I have eight grandchildren today. I wish you could meet them. I wish they were here right now. You could meet the whole family because that's the fruit. That's the bribe byproduct of what you're trying to create. So as a result of that, of following God, God had deeper plans for Jim and Sally Homer than we ever dreamed of. Uh, today, we've, between Sally and I, have written nine books. Sally's written five books. They've gone worldwide. Our, our simple lives, and both Sally and I were very simple people. We're still very simple people today. Our lives have touched over half a million people around the world. That's evangelism. Can you imagine if every family would just follow the plan of life that God has for them in store, you become an evangelist because you can't keep all that good just to yourself. God wants you to share it with others. So as a result, we've written 14 books. They've been translated in over 30 languages. Um, I think my head book would be called Escape to God. We've spoken in over 20 countries and 50 states. So why do I tell you that? Because God's plan of living is very effective. <laughs> I did not know that 34 years ago. I didn't know what God was going to do with us, but God put us in a study. And you remember, country living is only an aid to bring you into a closer walk with God and to protect you from the influences of the worldly society we have. It's, it, and if you use it correctly, God will enhance your life. He did for us, He will for you. He says in 2 Corinthians, uh, chapter 6, verse 16 and 17, I will dwell in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. 
I can honestly say to you today that he is my God and we're his people. And we're here to help other people find the same thing that we found. So what I'm asking you to do is to think what God is calling you to and think outside the box too. listen and plan then step out in faith and remember that the shoe that fits one person pinches another. There's no recipe for country living that suits all cases. So because of that overview that all I did was give you an overview of what we had. Now I want to share with you, uh, our life started affecting a lot of other people's lives. They didn't just affect us and our family but they started affecting a lot of people around the world. And we got a call from Pacific Union College in California. And Pacific Union College made a very unusual request for myself and my wife. They said, would you come here and would you share with us the reason so many families fail when they move to the country? <laughs> well, I'm a very proactive person. I'm not a reactive person. And I said, you want me to share with you why the people that are moving to the country are failing? And they said, yes, they said, you know, hundreds of families that have attempted this and you know, many of them have failed at it. And I said, yes, I do. So that really uh, caused me to really think through what are the elements of the families that we know that have succeeded in moving to the country and raising a godly family and having a uh, irresistible marriage. So I want to share those three imperatives with you now. These are the three positive things. So we looked at hundreds of families that we know. We looked at the families that failed and we looked at the families that succeeded. And the ones that succeeded all had three things in common. And they're very simple because God's plan for the family life and for the Christian life and the growth of the church is very simple. It's not very complicated. So these are the three things that I would ask that you, you really write them down and you focus on them for what God is asking you to do in each of the three. And remember, the shoe that fits one doesn't fit another person. So the way you may go at it may differ than the way Sal and I went at it. Uh, so make it unique to yourself with God. So number one, we must simplify. Number two, we must prioritize. Number three, we must cultivate. Those are the three things. And God made it very simple. So let's take a look at the first one. If we don't simplify our lives and bring them down to the irreducible minimum, we will not find the time to prepare for the coming events. Time is the element that we all face, and the devil knows that. So he keeps you so overly busy. It's the snare of Satan to keep God's people so busy that they will have but an intellectual conversion. That's what I had when we moved to the woodland. I had an intellectual conversion. Yes, I had some lifestyles that changes, but I was still the one in charge. God wasn't the one in charge. And so the devil's goal is to just keep you as a foolish virgin, not let you become a wise virgin. And the difference between the foolish and the wise is that the wise virgins found the oil. They found the power. They found that sensitivity to God's spirit with them daily, that uh, they would recognize it and they would turn to it. And they would always say yes to God and no to self. So we must learn to resolve to slow our pace. My boys are wrestling with this presently is that they become so successful that now they've got to, they, they have to become unsuccessful to get the deeper type of success. So, so take time to spend with the God and your marriage and your family. Those are your priorities. Martin Luther, when he was talking to his cohort, Melanchthon said this, this is, comes from Great Controversy, page 210. I hate with exceeding hatred those extreme cares which consume you, if the cause is unjust, abandon it. I love it. The Martin Luther back in that day, the devil knew that he had to keep the people distracted back then. So Martin Luther says, I hate, I hate with extreme hatred, the extreme cares. We've got to whittle those things out of our life and abandon them. And that's just what Sally and I did 38 years ago. We determined that we would sacrifice everything that was good 
for the sake of that which was best. So what did you abandon people say to me? Uh, and is it biblical? So let me give you a biblical prescription. John chapter 15, verses one and two says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He lops off every branch that doesn't produce and he prunes those branches that bear fruit for even larger crops. So if you have a tomato plant and it's got a hundred blossoms on it and you want large juicy tomatoes, you've got to pick off some of those uh, uh, some of those flowers in order to produce larger crop of tomatoes. Isn't that right? So you're getting rid of good so that you can have best. Desire of Ages says it this way. Desire of Ages, page 677. By the way, that's my second most famous book in the world. If, if they ever put me in jail, which someday they probably will for preaching the gospel, and they said that I could not have the Bible, you know, the, the, but I could have any other book that I wanted, you know which book it would be? Desire of Ages. I think I've read that, that book six, seven times. Uh, it's that book in the life of Christ. If you haven't read that, you need to get it out and have family worship around it. It's a great book, but here's what she says. The excessive foliage that draws away the life current from the fruit must be pruned off. The overgrowth must be cut out to give room for the healing beams of the son of righteousness. Beautiful. So what did we get rid of? Our fourth goal was to get out of debt, period. So we sold our 3,000 square foot, all cedar log home and 40 park-like acres in the country. And we bought a 960 foot cabin that we fixed up. You saw the, the outward of it that we fixed up. Number two, I sold my five vehicles and went down to one vehicle. <laughs> Had one vehicle for th over 38 years. <laughs> That's all we operated out of. Number three, we removed all the distractions and all that was artificial from our life. People have a real hard time with this. They want to get out of debt. And they said, Jim, how can you go from that 3,000 square foot home to a 960 square foot home in just one vehicle? Are you crazy? Well, we did more than that. Ministry of Healing, page 456 says, we must turn away from a thousand topics that invite attention. There are matters that consume time and arouse inquiry, but they end in nothing. So I got rid of every newspaper. I got rid of every magazine. Uh, got rid of all the news. Didn't listen to any news anymore. I got out of politics. I didn't care what the Republicans said. I didn't care what the Democrats said because the solution to the world does not rest in the White House in Washington, D.C. The solution to the world rests in your house. And it's not important what's going on in the White House. It's what's important is what's going on in your house. That's why Jesus never got involved in politics, because politics will never solve the world's problems. It's evil. Leave it alone. God's the solution not the White House, not the President of the United States. So I left off politics. I left off all the fake news that's out there. Got rid of our TV, our TV programs. I even got rid of the telephone, believe it or not. We lived for three years without a telephone. It was beautiful. People thought we were crazy, but it was beautiful. Got rid of the competitive sports. I used to play football in high school. I was left halfback, not because of my size, but because of my speed. No more football. I no longer dealt with any of the peripheral issues of Christianity. In Christianity today, you can, you can immerse yourself in all kinds of peripheral issues when the core of Christianity is missing from your life. And you become an expert on all the fanaticism that's going on out there, but it doesn't connect you with God, yourself, or your marriage, or your family. So we, we got rid of all of that. And people said, Tim. <laughs> You're not. Yeah, I am. And I love it. And you know, we haven't gone back to any of that today. None of it doesn't matter. The shoe that fits one person does what? Pinches another. When when I tell people what, what our sacrifice was, they say, James, how can you do that? Well, when people come to our home and they see our family, our grandchildren, nobody feels sorry for us. You know that? 
they say, you, you, you have a fantastic marriage, and we do, we're in love today. They say, your boys are, are, are upstanding, not just citizens, but they're leaders in their churches, and your grandchildren are following the same way. Nobody feels sorry for us, but nobody wants to, to sacrifice with the prescriptions that God wrote for us. So I'm not telling you what to do. That's between you and God. Mine is to tell you my testimony and you'd let God speak to you. So I was wasting so much time on the peripheral life that I didn't have time to find that Enoch walk. So I got rid of all the peripheral and I still don't involve myself in it today. And I don't know anybody who feels sorry for me to tell you the truth. So I have a question. Jim, didn't you become out of balance with society in the church? Amen, amen, and amen. Yes, I'm out of balance today. I'm out of balance with the world. I'm out of balance with society. And I'm out of balance with the nominal Christianity that we see in our churches today. I'm not against the church, but I'm against the nominal Christianity that I see so so prevalent in the churches. And I'm not just talking about the church I belong. I'm talking about all the Christian churches. You know, there's 45,000 denominations in the world today. Sal and I have had the blessed experience to speak at 13 different denominations besides our own. And I can tell you when I go into the, those churches, they're stagnant, they're anesthetized, and they're robotic. When it comes to ha having that real walk with God that we have to have before we enter into the what's just before us in this world today. We're playing church and our religion satisfies us and religion doesn't satisfy Jim Honberger. Religion, just like the Bible in God's word, it says, you search the scriptures for in them, you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify in me and you will not come to me that you might have life. So even the scriptures can be a substitute for finding that walk with God. That's what Jesus said. That it, those were words of Jesus. Our church can become a substitute too. And the Christian churches have become a substitute for you finding that real intense experience with God in your daily life and bringing your marriage and your family. Don't let that happen. Go into your church and, and be a springboard to bring those people to a, a very uh, diligent walk with God. So are we out of touch i don't think we're out of touch with god but i do think we're out of touch with the world and with the christian churches today and i plan on remaining there to be honest with you but i plan on ministering to that world i plan on ministering to that church or those churches we don't just dump the world we don't just dump the churches uh, if you find something of value you take it back to the people that 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 need it and not be critical not be condemning Jesus was there to bring the connection to the people. His own church was, was the church that crucified him. It wasn't the Roman government that did it. He gave his life for that church. And that's what we are supposed to do today too as well. So did this produce results? Well, let me say this up front so everybody understands. Supplication alone does not produce results. We are not made righteous by living in the country and living a simple life. We must now take the redeemed time and utilize it for prioritizing our priorities. And our priorities, Sally's and mine, are character and relationships. That's all we live for. Who you become in Jesus Christ and the relationships you develop. So the second aspect is prioritize. Uh, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 25 and 27 says, I love this verse. This is, this is beautiful. This isn't Jim Oberger talking. This is God. It says, let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Wow. Is that a focused life? That was the life of Jesus Christ. He had a goal and a focus and nothing stopped him from that goal and focus. And that's what Sal and I did 38 years ago and we're still doing today. We all live 
in the treadmill of life today with so many duties and projects and demands and expectations and distractions and social relationships and entertainment and religiosity how do you how do you work through all that this is what sal and i did we sat down we defined the purpose for our life and so i would ask you to do the same thing this is what how we define it you can go on if you go on our uh on our website empoweredlivingministries.org you'll even see this posted yet today we posted that 38 years ago and it's still the same today so Sal and I redefined our lives into just five things. Now, I'm not telling you what, what you have to do. This is what we, we defined. And we still live those today. A real walk with God, number one. We had, to, we had to get out of churchianity and religiosity. We had to find that real walk with God because we were foolish virgins. We weren't the wise virgins. Uh, so number one was a real walk with God. Number two was an irresistible marriage. We, we, we didn't want to just coexist in our marriage. We, we wanted to be in love when we got old. Well, we're 72 years young today. I feel like I'm in my 30s. And I, I'll tell you, I'm in love with my wife. She's in love with me. Number three, we wanted a connected family. We wanted the, the fruit of our love for each other to produce the same fruit into our boys. So we wanted to connect them with God, make them strong characters so they could take that into their influences in their churches and their home lives and association with others. And that has been successful for us. Number four, we want to live a simple life. If you don't live a simple life, you're not going to have the time to keep your priorities in order. So we still live a very simple life today. All those things that I told you we got rid of back then, we still get rid of today. I should tell you that, do get involved a little bit in politics. I sent a book to President Donald Trump the other day. I was speaking down in Florida, the Three Angels Adventist Church in uh, January, and somebody told me they had President Trump's home address, Mar-a-Lago in Florida. So God impressed me. I took out my book that's been translated in like 34 languages, Escape to God. I sent it to President Trump. I haven't heard back from him, so that, that's my only contact with politics, by the way. <laughs> Anyways, number five was touching others' lives. You know, if you find the real thing, if you don't just find church membership and biblical knowledge and lifestyle reforms, there's nothing wrong with that. But all that is there to bring you to God and bring you under God. Even Jesus' life is there to connect you to God because you need Jesus to connect you with God. So we want to touch other lives. Well, our lives have touched over half a million people that we know of in the world. And people said we were nuts and we were crazy. Can you imagine if everybody's, every, every member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church would touch at least one other person's life a year? The work would be done quickly. Our lives have been able to touch over half a million and we're still growing. So... This gave us deciding power to say yes and no according to our priorities. So for 38 years, we've only picked up the things that lie within those five areas. Everything else we get rid of. And that's why people think we're crazy and we're fanatic. And we are compared to the world and to the church. But God didn't think we were crazy. And our children and our grandchildren don't think we're crazy. And the people's lives that we've been allowed to touch have not thought we were crazy either. So for 38 years, we ask one question, and we, we still do this today. This is the question. Is it worthy of our time, our attention, our energy, and our talent in lieu of our five priorities? So everything that comes into our life, we ask, is it worthy of our time, our attention, our energy, and our talent? And we say no to a lot of good things. We honestly, we really do. But we keep our 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 total endeavor in our walk with our God and to maintain an irresistible marriage, maintaining the fruit of our lives, which is our children, our grandchildren, and living the simple life so we will have time to work with people in Ireland, in Europe. We just got a call from Beijing, China uh, yesterday, asked us if we would do a similar event for them. So that's where we keep our life. We have no time for all the other peripheral. It's out of our life. We don't even bother with it. 
A lot of people get bogged down here because they can't eliminate the good for the best. I mean, they really wrestle here. You know, to me, it's like if you got an old beat up clunker of a car that's built in 1960 sometime and bumper is falling off and I come to you and I offer you a brand new Rolls Royce. And you say, well, I can't give up this old beat up clunker. I say, get your eyes off the old beat up clunker and get your eyes on the Rolls Royce, what God wants to give you. Because God wants to do with your life what he's done with our life. We didn't know we had gifts and talents for writing and for speaking, but God developed those as we, as we gave our life to him. He gave us other talents. If you use your one talent, he multiplies them. He's multiplied our talents and he'll do the same for you. He won't tell you up front what those are going to be, but he wants to use your life as a springboard to influence many other people's lives that we can't influence. So if you'll give your life to him, become a wise version, he'll use your life in the same way. There's a text in Psalms 55, 19 says, because they have no changes, therefore they fear not God. Ooh. Sometimes when I stand before the churches, I'll ask the question, I'll say, are you the same person you were five years ago? Are you the same person you were three years ago? Because if you are, you're not under God. If you've just plateaued and you're just going through the, your, your Christianity, your religiosity, your churchianity, whatever you want to call it, and you're just the same person you were three years ago, you're not allowing God to direct your life. God doesn't allow you to plateau and to sit idle and to not improve your marriage or to raise godly children or to touch other people's lives. There's no plateauing in the Christian life. So even Psalm says, because they have no changes, God may be calling you today to one of the biggest changes of your life. Not Jim Hornberger. My, my job is to give my testimony. Revelation says they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony and loved not their lives till the death. You're not to follow Jim Hornberger. I'm, I'm a human being. I make mistakes. I fall. I, I need Jesus Christ just like you need Jesus Christ. You need to ask yourself, what is God asking you to? Because Jesus wants to transform your life. He wants to revitalize your marriage. He wants to connect your family. He wants you to live a simple life. He wants you to touch other people's. This is not possible unless you truly simplify and prioritize your life. So Joshua 24, 15 says, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. 38 years ago, Sal and I had to ask ourselves who we were going to serve. And we want out. And we decide we wanted to find God and we wanted to serve him. And today we serve him with all our heart, mind, and soul. When I came to the point of understanding that the things that I had weren't good enough for me and even the church experience I had at that point wasn't good enough for me that I had to go deeper that was scary for me because I didn't know what deeper meant I looked at the people around me in the church and they didn't know what deeper meant so when I left nominal Christianity to find the living experience with Christ that was scary to me and you know there's a gospel order here second Peter chapter one verse five it says, giving all diligence, add to your faith. And it doesn't say knowledge. It says, add to your faith, virtue. And then add to your virtue, knowledge. Virtue is the power to accomplish the truth that God delivers to us. And so many of us Christians, we add to our faith knowledge, and we become very arrogant, and we don't have the power to overcome the things in our life. And that, that was Jim Hornberger. And so I, I had skipped a step. I had to go back and add virtue to my life, which is the power to accomplish the truth that God has written in his word. Without this power, which is Christ in us and through us, uh, we become arrogant. We become foolish virgins. We remain in a foolish virgin state. So I had to discover what faith was. And I, I thought faith was just a belief in God's word. And faith is more than a belief in God's word because the devils believe in tremble. Faith, it starts with a belief in God's word, but it requires a surrender of all your known choices to God. That's the second step of faith. The third step is a dependency upon Jesus Christ for the power to accomplish that. And the fourth step is that it's the motivation is love. 
And so what God was calling me to do, which was very scary, was to surrender all my known choices. Come to me, God says. And I'll do great things in your marriage. I'll do great things in your family. That was scary. I had to give up successful business, big fancy home, all my vehicles, uh, all the peripheral life. That's scary. Scared me to death. But I stepped out in faith. And God may be asking you to do the same thing today. Do you really have faith? Because if you're not surrendering all your known choices and you're not depending upon a power outside of you, and if you're motivated for reward rather than love, you really don't have faith. All you have is religion. So I decided I had to become a living demonstration of what God called me to. And that's uh, the first angel's message, by the way, Revelation 14, 6. We believe in the three angels' messages. In three words, the first angel's message is a demonstration. Demonstrate that you fear God and give glory to him. The only way you can give glory to God is reflect his image in your marriage, in your family, to your church, and to the world. So the first angel's message is a demonstration. The second angel's message is a proclamation of all the beautiful truths that he's given to this church. And the third angel's message is a warning of what's coming in this world. And we're so busy giving the warning and proclaiming, we don't have a demonstration. That's why we're not having success in our evangelism. That's why we, we haven't finished the work is we don't have the demonstration. Jesus' life gave, was a demonstration for 30 years. He lived a quiet life. Why didn't he go on and give the word uh, at, at age 12 or at age 18, at age 21? Because he had to be an example for you and I. He had to demonstrate that it can be lived in the family life first. If it can't be lived there, you don't have the real McCoy. So you have to have a demonstration. So I decided to cultivate a sense of God's presence, knocking at the door of my heart every day, and that I would act upon it daily, no matter what it was, so that I would really become a reflection of God's power in human flesh. Wow. Can you imagine if... A tenth of our church would do that. The work could be finished overnight. So let me give you an example of that. I love to climb mountains. And I told you I'm 72 years old and I go out hiking at least twice a week. And I love to climb 14,000 foot peaks. So I climbed uh, one of my favorite peaks, uh, the Wetterhorn Peak. It's about a six to seven mile hike in then up to the 14,000 foot peak down six or seven miles out. And then I came back home. And that was last fall. And my wife was, uh, she loves the garden. We have outdoor gardens and um, she was canning. When I came into the house about seven o'clock night, uh, she'd been canning all day long and all over our kitchen counter here. I mean, there was cans, there was bottles. and She was canning all the tomatoes. And uh, I sat down in our uh, lazy boy chair over here and I was tired. I mean, I was physically tired and I'm just sitting there. And what is God saying to me right now? Somebody want to tell me that? What is God saying to Jim over here? I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I've been out hiking. I've been in nature. I've been talking with God all day long. I come home and I sit down in my chair. What is God saying to me? He wants me to demonstrate that I'm under God, not under Jim Hornberger, not under a church, but under him. And so he's whispering to me and saying, Jim, get up and help your wife. Lord, I'm too tired. Jim, demonstrate that you believe in me and that I give you the grace to do what is best in your marriage. You know, there's only one word that, sacri that, that defines love, and that's sacrifice. If you won't sacrifice yourself for your wife or for your children, then you don't really love them. And so God's asked me to get up. So I got up, and I went in the kitchen. I just started cleaning up, and Sally looks at me. I didn't say anything. I wasn't patting myself on the back, but she saw that I was willing to sacrifice myself for her. That's what I'm talking about. Are you willing to sacrifice whatever it is for your marriage, for your children, for your church, for the world, people of the world? That's what Jesus did. 
that's what we're calling it, this us too. So we must cultivate a sense of God's presence with us wherever we're at, whatever we're doing. So even when you come home, you have to live the gospel in your family first. Because if it can't be lived in the family, it can't be lived in the church. If it can't be lived in the church, the church can't convert the world. And the way to change the world and the way to influence the church is to live it in the family life. You must find that. That's, that's God's equation. That's not my Jim Holmberger's equation. So if you feel like your church isn't the church it should be, then fix your family. You don't have to fix the church. Fix your family and become a demonstration to the church of what it should be. And then that church can become a demonstration to the world. And that's what country living is about. It facilitates that, that connection with God and it becomes an aid to finding that experience. And so I have people say to me, they say, well, it's too late for me. I'm too old or I can't do anything great. Well, I'd like to remind you that Abraham was 100 years old when he finally did something great. I'd like to remind you that Moses was 80 years old when he led the people out of Egypt and that Joshua and Caleb were in their 80s when they fought the giants in the land. So listen, we're 72 years young. We're not old. And we've only just begun. My wife just finished writing another book. And uh, our literary agent, uh, Bruce Barber, will be taking it to probably Thomas Nelson or some of these other kind uh, publishers to, to go out we're, we're still very active for god and if we can help you learn in a very short period of time which taken us a long period of time that's what we're here for so with that i'd like to open it up for some questions before we go into the practical aspect the, the second part will be called the perfect 10 minus 2 in other words what should this country property look for what what are the pitfalls that people find in the physical aspect of it and what, what, what should it look like for you? And what are the things that you should watch out for in buying property and selling property? So with that, if there's any questions, Luke, uh, yeah, I'd be perfect. happy to take them. That's fine. Jim, I got a few questions here already. And uh, before that, I just want to give a testimony. I got a message here from Mrs. Christina Brazaitian. So she told me that she works for the Latvia Christian Radio and that she was reading your book, Escape to God, for the past year live on the radio, right? So many, many people from Latvia were, were reading the book along her in the radio. And just yesterday, she found out about this meeting. So she said that is a pleasure to be here, that she doesn't believe you still that, you know, she's been able to, to be here with you in the meeting. And you see how God works, you know, that she was reading the book for a whole year. She never heard about you before, but, you know, today she was able to join the meeting. So praise the Lord for, for one of the many things he does miraculously. That, that is beautiful. May, may I say this? I know that God will do with each and every one of you. I can see some of your faces. You're all beautiful people. But I did. If you will, if you'll do what God is calling you to, He will enhance your your abilities. I hated English. I hated it in, in grade school. I hated it in high school. I hated it in college. But God, because I I enhanced the one talent that he gave me. He gave me other talents. And one of that talents now is writing. And so God wants to enhance your talent base. This isn't about me. But if God can do it with a simple little boy like Jimmy Holmberger, you know, for the first 30 days in first grade, I hid under the teacher's desk. I was such a shy, introvert person. But God has taken, because I was willing to place myself for, before God and say, God, fill me. If you will do that, he will not only improve your marriage and your family, but he'll give you other gifts to influence the rest of the world with so we can finish this work and get on, get back to heaven. So go ahead with any questions you have. Yeah, so for those that didn't get us in the beginning of the, the presentation, if you have any questions, because we have so many people uh, on the room, you know, and with previous experience, we'd be kind of messy if we allow everybody to talk over. So if you have any questions, uh, use the chat 
send me the question, you know, or send the questions directly to to Jim, or you can raise your hand, you know, and I can I can try to talk to you then. But I, I have a question here, uh, Jim, from from brother Daniel uh, from the Wilson family. So you say, can you ask um, with the pending crisis upon us, would you recommend renting? This could mean renting in the city or getting a mortgage and go to the country. We are faithful believers and want to follow the prophet's recommendations, but we are struggling. Our circumstances are preventing us to follow 100% of the country living principles, and we are not getting into that. So what do you suggest? Uh, I had a man come to our home. He wasn't an Adventist. He was a insurance salesman and I gave him the book Escape to God and when he left he read it and we've been working for him for two years now and he's keeping the Sabbath he's doing a lot of good things but he said to me he says Jim it's it's I don't have the money I uh, I'm in debt I uh, you know God can't work for me it's too late for me no it's not God meets every person where you're at today so if the best thing that you can do is rent maybe you can rent in the country uh, the, so not everybody's going to have the same ability. You're not going to have the same financial ability. They don't have the same skill set. They don't live in the same country. Do the best with what you have today. And God will honor that. And God will take care of you where you're at today. I can remember a couple called me from England. And this was about 15 years ago. They said, Jim, it's not possible for us to move in the country in England because only aristocrats can afford property in England. I says, well, have you thought about Scotland or Ireland? So they drove, they went up to Ireland and they were looking around and they called me and said, we don't have the skill set. We only got $20,000. Very young couple. They didn't, they didn't have uh, children yet. And uh, they said, uh, if we fly you to Ireland, I find this kind of ironic. Would you help us find some pro property? So 15 years ago, I flew to Ireland. They picked me up at the airport. We checked what was on the market in real estate and, and there was nothing in their price. I mean, they had $20,000. But I noticed as we were driving all over Ireland, there was all these cottages, these, these I guess they call them derelicts, these, these farm old farmhouses that were bought up by the government and all trees are planted around them. I said, take me to the Forest Service. These are nice homes. They got two foot thick walls and slate roofs. And yeah, there's some cows living in them now, but we can clean all that up. So we went to the Forest Service in Ireland and uh, they sold us uh, a derelict with one acre surrounding, it had a little creek coming through it. It was all planted Forest Service. And we cleaned the manure out of the house. We put in new windows and they had a cute little cottage. What I'm saying to you is they only had $20,000. We bought the property for 12,000, put his labor into it for another 8,000. They had a cute little place out in, the, out in the country in Ireland. So I don't know what your limitations are. God knows your limitations, but man's extremity is God's opportunity. God will work with you where you're at. And sometimes it's a stepping stone. In other words, you want to go here, but God has to take you here and then here and then here. But if you're living in God's will and the best you can do is just rent a place in the country, then just rent the place. And God will take care of you. God knows the condition of your heart and he'll work with you for where you're at today. Thank you very much, team. The next question I have here, uh, it's what is the difference between the monastic life and the experience you are talking about? The monastic life that you see uh, in the, uh, basically Catholic church, I was raised Catholic by the way, where they all the people went to a monastery and they just lived in ice. It's very selfish. It's, it's, not, it's not done for the purpose of, it, it's done for the purpose of selfish um, reflection where I'll just live in my own little cocoon all to myself. Uh, we're not talking about that. Now you may, need, you may need some monastic life like Moses did. You may have to have a quiet life for 40 years until you find the real experience. Uh, but we're not talking about hiding ourselves in a cave. We're talking about using it as a tool to remove the distractions, which a monastic life did, 
but then to use that time to not just find God, but to bring God into our marriage, into our family, into our churches, and into the world. So it's, it's done to find something and then to bring that something into all the relationships of life. So it isn't done just for yourself. It's done to enhance your Christian experience and then to bring it through all the relationships. Remember I said life is only about two things for Jim Hoberger, and that's the character you become, and that's the uh, relationships that you develop. And so there's nothing wrong with seclusion. God uses seclusion. He put the uh, apostle Paul, when he was knocked off his high horse, when he was Saul, he didn't send them all preaching right away. He put them into the wilderness of Arabia for three years to find an experience and then take that experience out to other places. That's the difference. Thank you very much. Now the next question here, uh, he comment, fascinating, glad I turned in inspirational stuff, uh, full of common sense. Problem, I missed the third imperative for successful country living. Can you repeat it? So the first one is simplify, simplify your life. The second one um, is prioritize, find out what the top priorities, the, the best. And the third one is cultivate cultivate a sense of God's presence with you. Remember when I was sitting there and Sally was canning, uh, you cultivate a sense of God speaking to your conscience because God speaks not only through his word, but he speaks to you through his spirit. He tells you how to, to translate this into actions. So this says, love your wife. Well, when I came home, I, I could take a written exam and says, yes, I should love my spouse. So I pass a written exam, but do I pass the driver's test? You know, in the United States, when you go for a driver's license, you got to pass a written exam. That's the head knowledge, but you have to pass the written, the driver's exam. Now you got to prove you can drive that vehicle without crashing the other people. That's where God gives you the Holy Spirit, because you're not capable of just carrying this out. The Old Testament said all that God has said we will do. No. Jim Holmberger can't be in charge. Jim Holmberger has to surrender his in chargedness to God. And God says it's imperative that I leave, that I may send you my spirit. And he will guide you. So when, when I go into my day, yes, I've got, I've, got, I've got the guidelines for my life, but I also have a guide with me. And that's God's spirit. And we want to become so sensitive to the still small voice of God that the slightest whisper of God will move our soul. That was Jesus. Very sensitive to God. And so we want to become extremely sensitive to the spirit of God because that's what guides you through what's ahead. I don't have a prescription for your life, but God has the prescription. I can tell you to read the Bible, but God will tell you how to interpret that for your marriage for your family, for your pocketbook, for your skill set. God already has a program before you even start on it that he's designed for you to enter into. So my job is, a, is to convince you to not just follow God's word, but to be sensitive to the still small voice of God, Isaiah 30, 21. And thine ear shall hear a word behind thee saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. When you turn to the left and when you turn to the right, God says, I have a way for you and I'll translate that for you. If you'll spend time with me, if you'll bring your life down to the irreducible minimum, because most people's minds are so bombarded with so much information that they can't even hear God's still small voice to them. And God says, Psalms 49, 10, be still and know that I am your God. And we don't have that time to be still and know, so we don't have God's prescription for us individually. And you need that if you're going to venture out and do what, what uh, God has called us to do. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I have another question here. We have a new enemy, uh, social media inside our homes. During your time when you moved to the country, you removed TV and magazines. What is your personal view for the social media and phones nowadays? Social media is an addiction to nosiness, and it's a brag sheet for lifting up yourself. Uh, I was asked by Canadian Union College, an Adventist college up in Canada, to, to speak on social media, especially Facebook. 
I've never been on Facebook. By the way, I do have a Facebook page today, I'll tell you what. But so when I looked into it and I looked at the disaster with people, when, when, when I went on Facebook the first time, I went on somebody else's computer and I took a piece of paper, I took a pen and I spent eight solid hours on Facebook. I'd go to one person's site and another person's site and another person's site. When I was done with it, I was so, I was so distraught. Uh, this says Philippians 4, 8, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are a good report, think on these things. And when I went to social media, people were just lifting themselves up. They were just, it's like a brag book. It's like, look what I've done. Look what I have. Look what I think. And, and um, so I decided to call uh, a couple of people that were on Facebook. And I called this one gal that I knew that uh, very spiritual gal. She just got married, uh, given her counselor. Her name was Elizabeth. And I said, Elizabeth, I went to your Facebook site. I got on it from somebody else's. And, and I said, can I ask you some questions? Oh, Mr. Hornberger, what are you going to ask me? And I said, well, Elizabeth, uh, the reason I want to ask you is I know that you'll be honest with me. I said, so what's the first thing you do in the day when, when you wake up? Oh, Mr. Holmberger, do I have to answer you? I said, no, you don't. But I, I got to talk to all these college kids and your college age. And I got to, I, I got to know what I'm talking about. She said, well, I always go to my Facebook page. I said, why do you go to your Facebook page? I want to know what's going on. I said, so when you go to your Facebook page, what do you look up? Oh, Mr. Holmberger, I don't want to tell you. I said, well, come on, Elizabeth. I got to be able to talk to these college kids. She says, I'd look up my old boyfriends. I said, Elizabeth. Aren't you just married? You've only been married a year or two, haven't you? Yes. Why do you look up your old boyfriends? Oh, Mr. Holmberg, I don't want to tell you. I said, tell me. I want to see how miserable they are. I said, Elizabeth, what is going on? You start your day by going to Facebook, looking up your boyfriends to see how miserable they are? What, what's going on? And so when I would start interviewing people why they're really on Facebook, uh, I was disturbed. I, I decided I would never be on Facebook, never enter social media until uh, about a year and three months ago, somebody contacted me and said, Mr. Holmberg, you are making some big mistakes. And I said, what is that? They said, you need to be on Facebook. I, so I told my story and they said, no, 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 no. Use Facebook to bring a spiritual message to all those people. So I really prayed about it. And about a year and three months ago, I started a Facebook page and I I put a post in on almost every week, but it's only for spiritual reasons. It's never to lift me up, never to lift up what I have, what I've done, where I've been, things of that nature. It's not for gossip. It's only for a spiritual tool, just like Zoom right now. I use Zoom as a tool, praise God, because people can't afford to just fly to Ireland or to China or places of that nature. I can speak to you right out of my own home. So Facebook, social media today is a disaster to most people's spiritual lives. And you've got to ask yourself why you are on Facebook. You really have to ask yourself that question. I'm on Facebook, so, but I'm on it for spiritual reasons because it can steal your time and you need time. The devil knows, T-I-M-E. We only have so much time. And if I'm not giving myself to God in the morning and connecting with him like Elizabeth wasn't, then I'm not having the real walk. I'm just going to my church. I'm going through the Sabbath school thing. I'm just listening things. I'm talking. I'm plateaued. I'm the same person I was. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with going to church. Don't take me wrong there. But if you're just plateaued and, and church is supposed to step you up higher, to a, a, a deeper walk. Church is supposed to be a springboard to take you to God, not to itself. And so if you're just plateauing and going through the motions, you're feeling good because you got the correct doctrines and you got some lifestyle down, and you know better than those other Protestant churches, uh, you're in trouble. You're a foolish virgin. So my advice to most people is social media is a tool to keep you distracted from having the best, and that's a walk with God. Amen. And can you believe it that I, I remember your exact words 
12 years ago in Camp Clock about the Facebook and I never got an account, you know, and uh, so so you did you did teach a lesson for me and you know, I never got a Facebook account because of that and many other reasons, but you're absolutely right on that. Jim, you let me know about time. I have three or four more questions here. Can we go forward or do we want to move to the next message? That's up to the people. So you you decide that. I can I can move into the uh, physical aspect of it. What a country, you know, what you should watch out for. But are we going to answer a few more questions? Okay, perfect. So listen, do you believe that a family who are appointed to serve people in a big city can live according to the same principles? Yes and no. We're told that in Nero's household, many of his servants, slave servants, actually became Christians and lived the Christian life in Nero's household. I mean, what are you going to do with that? But the ideal is what we should always look for. They didn't have a choice. So even Daniel, when he was taken captive and brought into Babylonian captivity, uh, had a deep experience with God. Even Joseph, when he was taken uh, captive to Egypt, but none of them were willful acts. Uh, my example would be Abraham. God called Abraham out of the city and into a quiet setting. If you would have met Abraham, I mean, let's bring Abraham up to the 21st century. So we we run to Abraham, and he's got his U-Haul uh, truck all packed full of all his possessions. And I stop Abraham on the road and say, Abraham, where are you going? What would he say? I don't know. What? Are you nuts? Are you crazy? Why are you leaving? God's asked me to leave the city. He's asked me to move to the country. Well, wh what's that going to look like? I don't know. Where are you going? I don't know. All I know is that God is leading me. So if because of your circumstances, you are unable to go for God's ideal or, or improve it slightly, in other words, move out of a big city to a smaller city. If you're in a smaller city, move into the suburbs. If you're in the suburbs, move into the country. If you're in the country, we move to the wilderness. Now we, we sold our, our, our home in the wilderness uh, almost eight years ago. And we moved to the southwestern Colorado. We're in the country now. We've got 30 acres here. I wish I could show it to you. We've got three creeks coming through our property, three springs, a million gallon acre pond. And we're in the country really close to the mountains now rather than the wilderness. So God has different stepping stones for each of us. So you have to know what's the best that God can do with you presently. And if you're improving, that's the key. So try to improve your situation by redeeming your time, getting out of debt, getting rid of all social media, all the politics, all that kind of stuff, and finding that real one-on-one -on -one time with God. Because without that real one-on-one -on -one time with God, you're not going to be an Enoch. You're not going to be a Joseph. You're not going to be a Daniel. And if that's not your goal, something's wrong. Something's seriously wrong. Because you're just going to end up a foolish virgin having all. You can pass the head knowledge, the test, but you'll never gain entrance to the kingdom because you only accept what God has done for you rather than accepting what God is doing in you and through you. And that's the complete gospel. What God has done for you, in you, and through you. So you got to, us Christians have only accepted what God has done for us, and we're not allowing him to work in us and through us. And the best setting for that, God says, not Jim Hohenberger, is a quiet location, wherever that is for you. Amen. Thank you. Next question. Uh, what advice can you give to one if they are married to an unbeliever looking for country property at the moment, but will have different priorities? Yeah, it's very difficult. Uh, we work with a lot of split families with unbelievers, and it just creates tremendous chaos in the person that wants to do what they should do. Um, the best thing that you can do, we have a whole series it's free a lot of our you know we have a youtube site that's got over three dozen messages on it and uh one of those uh messages there's five messages that deal with how to take any marriage from a stalled situation into a, a deeper situation and i give living examples of that so go to our youtube site if you go to empoweredlivingministries.org 
uh, then we have a YouTube site, go on our YouTube site and there's a, a series on, on marriage and how to take uh, those marriages that are not functioning the way they should. And there's principles in that marriage for you as a believer that if you follow will give you a good opportunity at your husband coming on board. Doesn't give a guarantee because God always gives liberty to each person, whether they follow God or not. So it's not a guarantee, but it'll put you on a better platform than what you're presently on. Okay, and I have just two more. I have plenty more, but I chose two here. So Jim, what are the minimal requirements to call it a country living environment to prepare us for the second coming of Christ? The minimum requirement, they, I think they're talking about the uh, physical requirements, and I'm going to be talking about that in just a second. Perfect 10 minus two. So uh, I'll go over that when we finish the questions here and I'll answer that directly with the 10, 10 aspects. And the last one that, uh, and I apologize for the ones that I, I couldn't hear because we have so many. So I chose the most ones that will more uh, be more related to the message. So this one here, prioritizing your life. How would you put God first? Practical pieces of advice about your wife, children, ministry, and other business? Well, when I moved to the country, uh, God wasn't first in my life. And what I did, honestly, what I did is I said I was going to tithe my time. And so I told the Lord I'd, there was 24 hours in a day. I'd give him two and a half hours. And I divided that up in prayer time with God. And then uh, I would have... Uh, I would study different things. And then I would have a family worship in the morning and a family worship in the evening. Each of those family worships were about 20 minutes long. We'd sing, we'd pray, we'd read something, we'd discuss it. So every day of my life, I gave God two and a half hours. That's what I did. And it worked very well for me. And that meant that I didn't have time. I mean, if, if you, I mean, when you're raising two young children, and to give God two and a half hours, I mean, you don't have time to listen to the news. You don't have time to go on the internet. You don't have time for social sites. There weren't any social sites back then. You don't have time for all those telephone conversations. You don't have time to go do all that miscellaneous shopping. You don't have time for football on Sunday. I mean, what was I doing? I, I was the head elder of the church and I'd invite the other elders over and we'd watch the Green Bay Packers beat up the Chicago Bears on Sunday for three, four hours. And all the time, my wife wants me to take her for a walk and hold her hand and she wants to talk. And I'm watching stupid football. You only have so much time. So when, when I finally had the courage, that God gave me the courage to cut all that stuff out, and it, it really seemed extreme. So it actually seems extreme to some people that know us today too. But uh, I gave my time to God and God multiplied, uh, just like tithing. When I first became an Adventist Christian, they told me I should tithe. I, I was too cheap to tithe. <laughs> and I put $10 in the plate and I put $20 in the plate. And, and my wife said, you know, you're almost tithing. Why don't you just tithe? And I said, I don't know if I have the courage to do that. So I finally started tithing. And my brother came to me, he says, what are you doing in your business? You've become so successful. And when I look back, I saw a pattern that when I gave more to God, God gave more back to me. And when I, when I started doing what I didn't think I could do, which was tithing, in fact, I don't just tithe today, I give 20% of everything to God, just right off the top, you just, everything. Because God multiplies what you give to him. So if you, if you will step out in faith, and you will give him his, your time, and you will center in on God, and you'll honestly do that in, a, in an honest fashion, God will multiply your relationships, he'll multiply your life, he'll multiply your skill set. That's who God is. But he has to see a faithfulness coming from you. He gave everything for you, you are to give everything back for him. That's the equation. That's the, that's the story of the pearl of great price. When the man went out and he found the pearl of great price of the, the hidden treasure, he went home, he sold everything and possessed it. We don't do that. We find it. 
but we don't go home and sell everything in order to possess it. And that's the problem with Christianity today. We find the story about the pro great price, the hidden treasure. We can tell other people about it. We have found it, but we haven't possessed it. And what God called me to do was to possess it. And God has no respect of persons. If he's done what he's done for Jim and Sally, he'll do it for you. He'll do it in a little different fashion because he's created you with a different skill set. But he will use you in a fashion you've never even dreamed. But you have to step out in faith and you have to give him that time so he can create in you that new heart and that new spirit so that it's no longer you. It's not Jim Homer in charge. It's God in charge working in and through you. That's the key to success. That's the key to changes our churches too. You can't, you can't fix the church if you don't fix the man. And so if we want to fix the church and the church wants to fix the world, you got to fix the man. And that's what we're talking about here. You got to fix you. And that takes time with God. So try God out. <laughs> he won't disappoint you, I'll guarantee you. I don't know anybody that feels sorry for me today because I tithe my time and I don't have time for social media. I don't have time for politics. I don't have time for football. I don't have time for magazines. I don't have time for all any of that stuff. I just have time for our five priorities. And I don't know anybody, anybody that feels sorry for us. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. And I have a question. I remember reading one of your books, I think it was Reverse Priorities, or uh, I think it was Cape to God. You told us that in the beginning of your walk, you know, because you have this German background, you know, and I, I do as well with Polish. So in theory, we are enemies. <laughs> uh, I remember you say that you were driving and you would listen to God's voice, you know, Jim, turn left and you and you would not. So some people can can multiply this question, like when we have a call to move country, when we have a call to leave my, my good job in the big city and move to the country, when I have a call to do something that goes against the logical of society, how can you differentiate this from your own conscience? How can you say that, no, this is the voice of God, or no, this is just common sense or my conscience speaking to me? Excellent question. Excellent question. Uh, first of all, everything has to agree with the word of God. In other words, if there's a call on your heart and it goes against the word of God, it doesn't come from God. So first of all, everything has to agree with the word of God, but not, not everything that comes to us is necessarily uh, discernible from the word of God. For example, I had a friend of mine, his name was Dwight. He came to my house and he was going to take me out for the day and we're going to spend the day together. And he was, that was our our home in the, up in Polebridge. I think I showed you a picture of that. People have come here lately. So he, he comes in the front door of our home and he says, Jim, you're ready to go. And I said, yeah, let's go. And then all of a sudden I, I get a still small voice says to me, Jim, uh, hang up the laundry. What do you mean hang up the laundry? And I'm walking right past our little laundry room and there's my buddy waiting for me and the Lord saying, Jim, hang up the laundry. And I've become very sensitive to God's advanced call upon my heart because God knows what he's doing. He knows what he wants you to do. So because of that sensitivity that was built up in a lot of quiet time with God, I, I said, Dwight, just hang on, get a glass of water. I'll be with you in a second. I picked up the laundry basket. I went outside on the clothes that I'm, I'm painting up the clothes. And I looked behind me and my buddy's sitting there with a glass of water looking at we don't look at it. What are you doing, Hornberger? What, what, what are you doing hanging up your wife's laundry? So I get back in the house and said, Dwight, let's go. So we get in the car. We had a word of prayer before we left. And he looks at me, he says, what are you doing hanging up your wife's laundry? I said, first of all, Dwight, it's not my wife's laundry. It's our laundry. God asked me to. He says, what do you mean God asked you to? And that set the stage for our conversation for the entire day. God knew that Dwight needed to see me sacrifice myself for my wife to aid her before I went out with him. When he saw that, God knew that it would stimulate the conversation for the day. So these are my rules. It has to go along with God's word. So God asks us to put our wives first, right? So it's not against God's word to hang up the laundry, gentlemen, <laughs> believe me, or help or clean up the kitchen. So God always asks us to sacrifice. But if it makes me a servant to somebody else, 
if it humbles me, if it puts someone else first before myself, it's not from the devil. Are you with me? So if it's not contrary to God's word, if it humbles you, makes you a servant to somebody else, uh, put somebody else before yourself, try the spirits, the Bible says. So then test it. I was going down the road one day. I, I got a, uh, <clears throat> my wife called me in the house. I was hooking up my utility trailer and I was going to go down the 50 mile gravel road. It was very bumpy, very chuck holy. And I had my trailer on. I thought I had latched it down, a utility trailer, because I had to pick up some supplies down 60 miles in town. So I went in the house, came back out, jumped in the car, and I started taking off. And this still small voice, remember Isaiah 30, 21, and now ears shall hear a word behind thee saying, this is the way. God's watching over us. God also says in John that my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. So I'm driving down the road and still small voice saying, Jim, check the trailer. No, I don't want to check the trailer. I, I'm all taken care of. God always has advanced wisdom for us, for you and for me. God knows my trailer's not hooked down. He's got to tell me that. He doesn't text me. He doesn't call me on the phone. He doesn't send me an email. He doesn't speak to me audibly. He impresses my conscience. And if my conscience is made sensitive to God every day, then I'm sensitive to him speaking to me. I don't have the radio blasting right now, music playing. It's just quiet in the car. And I said, Lord, is that you? And Lord said, yes, check your trailer. So I stop the car, I get out, and I see my trailer's not hooked up. God wants to give you advanced knowledge for your life to save you from a lot of problems. So if you develop a sensitivity to the still small voice of God, such as I had a friend that says to me, God never speaks to me. He always speaks to you, Jim, but he never speaks to me. I, could, I can tell you the last time God spoke to you, my friend. He said, what are you talking about, Jim? I says, your wife always asks you to do grocery shopping after you uh, get out of work, doesn't she? He says, yes. I says, last time you were in the, in the line for the grocery store and there's all those magazines in front of you with all those pictures of unclad women, what did God say? And he said, don't look. I said, what did you do? He didn't answer me. He says, that's God speaking to me? I says, yes, it's called your conscience. And you can make your conscience dead and you can make your conscience very sensitive. And it's done by reading God's word, having prayer time and listening to him. And the more you try God out, the more sensitive your conscience becomes to the still small voice. Some people have seared their consciences because of the pornography they look at, the type of food they look at, the busyness of their life, the treadmill pace they're on. Country living allows you to quiet the conscience so you don't have all these distractions so you can be aware of God's presence with you. And then you can act upon it. It's your choice. Amen. So, Jim, that, that's all the questions we had here. Uh, thank you very much. So if you want to jump for the next message, if you want to have a glass of water, it's up to you. You're the boss here. Sure, let's uh, Sally could have some more water, please. So let's take a look at what this physical property should look like, ideally. So I call it the perfect tenant. In other words, if you have a perfect piece of property for living in the country, what does that look like? And then I call it minus two. Why do I do that? And you could say minus three, you could say minus four but because not everybody's gonna be able to get the perfect piece of property because we're at different stages. We have different finances. We live in different countries. We have different laws. So let's take a look at the 10 aspects of a perfect piece of property. And then God will have to define what that looks like for you. I can't do that. God will do it for you. But first, let's make sure it's biblical because we always wanna make sure we're not following a excuse me, a man, Isaiah 32, verse 17 to 18, and my people, notice he says, my people shall dwell in a peaceful habitation and in sure dwellings and in quiet resting places. So God says that his people, he doesn't say people are just going to church, his people, are you one of his people? 
are going to live in what? Peaceful habitations, quiet resting places, shared dwellings. This is God speaking. This isn't Jim Unberger. Also, if you ever, if you haven't ever done this, this is all the quotes of Mrs. White on country living. Powerful pamphlet put out by your ABCs. Uh, if you want all the instruction in country living from Mrs. White from Spirit of Prophecy, but let me tell you, if it wasn't for Spirit of Prophecy, I wouldn't be who I am today. I, I read it, uh, read it, read it, reread it. Very powerful stuff. So go to your ABC and get that booklet. Uh, second uh, Bible text, Second Corinthians chapter three, verse five. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves. To think anything as of ourselves, our sufficiency is of God. And boy, I can't stress that. I have friends that they have 20 years of food stocked up. They got solar power. They got hydropower. They got their gardens. Their sufficiency is in their country setting and in their guns and their gold and their gardens. No. Now, should we have those? Yes. But never as in our Isaac. You know, Abraham had too much of a trust in Isaac, and God called Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, not because he wanted Isaac, but because he wanted Abraham. So, yes, let's be sufficient, but our sufficiency is in God. We move to the country as an aid, not as our salvation. I hope that's understood here. I, I want that understood right up front because there's too many people that are, are doing it in their own human strength and they got all their gardens and they got their gold and they got their guns and they got their solar power, but they don't have Christ in them. They don't have the first angel's message, which is a demonstration. Their marriages are miserable. Their families are not well-ordered, well-disciplined, Christ-centered, but yet they got all the physicalness together, and God's going to let that all be taken from them, just like Isaac was going to be taken from Abraham. But when Abraham surrendered to Isaac, he got it back. So let's not make our sufficiency in what we're going to talk about here. Let's use it as an aid to our spiritual and our social well-being, okay? I just want to make sure that's, that's right up front. There's a lot of people are going at this wrong. So number one is water. You got to have water to live. Water is an absolute essential. Now that water can be city water. It can be delivered to you from a pipe, from a source that they can cut you off on. It's better if it's live water. In other words, it's water that I can control. Such on, on my home here presently that we bought, we have three creeks coming through. We have three springs on our property and we have a million gallon pond. I mean, I got an abundant and I own the water. I have a water right to it. Just because the water's coming through your property, the government may own the right to that water and they could shut you down from using it. So you wanna make sure you file for the water rights on those springs, on that open water, on that pond, on those creeks that are coming through. Cause somebody might have a, a right, a farmer might have a right to that creek down the, down the uh, uh, roadways, and if there's a drought, there may not be enough water for you and him to use. He may have the first right on it. So you want to look for a property that has live water, a lake, a creek, springs, a river, uh, your own well. A lot of people have a well, but they're they're dependent upon power to bring that water up. Maybe the well is down. Maybe the water's down 100 feet or 160 feet. What my sons have done is because they don't have live water in their country properties, they have wells and they've put a hand pump on the well as well as electric power pump. So on their pump, if the power ever goes out, they got a hand pump that they can pressurize their whole house and just send their kids out and pump the water. <laughs> you at least got water. So you gotta have water. And then that, if, if it's just, a, if it's a well, you want you can you can have solar power for that pump you can have wind power for it you can have a hand pump so water is absolutely essential in the home that i had up in um, um, up by glacier park this home here we had a creek that came through and then we had a spring up 
behind us and it was uh, 20 feet higher than the house. We ran a pipe up to it was 100 gallons a minute and we just had water all pressurized our house. And we had our sprinklers going 12 months out of the year. The UPS driver would come to the house and say, why is your sprinkler sprinkling the snow? <laughs> I says, well, the water just is free. It just runs all the time and it just melts my snow ahead of time. So water, very important. Number two is soil. When we moved our home up in the wilderness, not where we are here, but in the wilderness, we didn't have any good soil. It was rock and gravel and sand. We, we sat up on a five acre uh, peninsula and had a creek down beneath us spring up, but, but it was just, we didn't have any soil, man. I could grow weeds, that's about it. So we went down into the valley where there was uh, Amish uh, Mennonite community and uh, they didn't use uh, herbicides and pesticides. And, we bought some of their soil and we had it trucked up. So we, even though, so use your imagination, we didn't have the soil we needed, but we bought the soil that wasn't uh, filled with a lot of chemicals and we brought it to our property, it was all organic soil. Am I coming through? Can I hear you? Now, now we can. So uh, if you can repeat the last 20 seconds, Jim, please. Okay, so soil. You want to have soil. Did I tell you about uh, how we brought soil up to our house? Yeah, yeah, we got that part. Okay. So why do, you want, why do you want to grow food? You know, when I was growing up, everybody in the neighborhood, in the city, had a garden. It was behind a garage or something. We had raspberry plants, and tomato plants, and cucumbers, and carrots. It's because someday they're going to control you through food and you know it's here. You know it's happening right now. And you want to have an access to grow your own food and not be dependent upon the system. Remember that uh, we want to have a, a self-sufficient place as much as possible. We want to not rely upon outside sources. So when we came to our property here, where we're presently at, uh, we didn't have uh, real good soil on the property. So we hauled in in our present home too. And we put in our landscape. You can see our landscaping. I planted 300 trees and shrubs and put in park-like uh, with our grass and we irrigate our, our farm. But it's all set up for fruit trees. We got cherry trees, we got apple trees, we got peach trees. I mean, we got so much food coming out selling, I can't even can it and, and handle it all. Why? because it takes time it takes i have to go outside i take care of that yard well that's good i don't go to the gymnasium and work out on weights and run on a physical treadmill all my exercise is productive <laughs> my sons say well why don't you buy the right lawnmower because i need the exercise if you look at my waist i don't have a waist you know i'm 72 years old i haven't put on any weight why because i exercise on a daily basis and the lifestyle that i live keeps me slender and fit, keeps me healthy. I don't have a gym membership. I have a garden. <laughs> Mrs. White says, every exercise that a human per person needs is found in the garden. Isn't that interesting? I don't like the garden, to tell you the truth. My wife loves the garden, but I do it out of principle. So soil, you wanna make sure that you have good soil. When we were up in the wilderness, uh, we built a greenhouse. I don't have a greenhouse here because we're in southern, southwestern Colorado. We have abundance of sunshine. But up there, we couldn't grow some of the food, so we built a greenhouse. So there's always a way around it, depending upon where you live. So soil is number two. Number three is timber. <clears throat> Texas, this, this winter, there was millions of people because of the cold weather that came into Texas, froze up. A lot of the heating plants and the solar, not the solar power, but the wind power that was down there. 
uh, how are those people, a lot of those people are freezing to death. They couldn't heat their homes. So you wanna make sure you've got timber, you got trees. Uh, if you could see my house right now, we have a wood stove over there in the living room so that if the power goes down, we have geothermal. that's how our house is heated. Generally, it's the most efficient heating system in the world. But if that goes down and I don't have the power for that, I have a wood stove here and I have plenty of trees on the property so I can heat my house, I can cook with it. Uh, if you saw our, our former home, we had a wood cook stove. And we could we could cook everything just with the trees on our property. Uh, we could build with it. We we cut the trees down. We built our greenhouse out of the trees on our own property. We would dry Sally dries fruit every day. I mean every year. And we had a, a a food dryer that was over our wood cook stove. So timber is very important. Timber becomes a very useful tool to keep your house heated and to cook food with. Very important. Number four is the climate you know, that you go to. You want to look at the, the seasons that you go into. The growing season is very important. Now, when our for, former home up in the wilderness didn't have a very good uh, growing season, that's why we had a greenhouse where we're at presently. It has an excellent growing season. I mean, right now it's just first of April. Our, our flowers are coming up. Our trees are out. Sally will be planting the garden. Uh, our uh, apple trees and are blossoming. Uh, so presently, we have a good growing season, but we lived in a place of dent. You have to decide that for you, and you have to decide the uh, climate that's conducive to you. When I was 34 years old, living up in the wilderness, we got five feet of snow on the ground. Uh, at the 1st of April, we'd be at five feet of snow. I got tired of shoveling that snow off the greenhouse roof and cleaning up the driveway and cleaning up around the house. And in our age, I realized that if something happened to me, Sally probably wouldn't be able to maintain that in the wilderness. So we moved down here where we barely get any snow at all. We get it up in the mountains, but we get a little scattering on our ground and it melts off in a week or so. So you, the, the temperature range, the climate has to be conducive for who you are. We knew we were growing older. We knew we were gonna have less ability to maintain uh, that kind of snow level and that kind of climate, especially if something happened to me. Uh, so we moved down here where we had a growing season. You decide for yourself. I like a lot of sunshine though, because I like to be outside hiking and climbing those mountains because that, that keeps me healthy. I, I usually, I'm writing an article for the Facebook. I'm gonna poster for, uh, a message I'm given, and then I go out hiking for four or five hours, and then God speaks to me when I'm out in the country, when I'm out in the mountains. And I always carry a little little pad of paper in my pocket and a little pen, because my mind opens up when I'm out there in God's creation, and there's no human beings around, just me, and I'm up in the high country. And that's where a lot of uh, my books have come from. A lot of my creativeness comes when I'm alone with God out in the mountains. So that's very important to me, precipitation and humidity. I don't like a, a humid climate. I like a very dry climate, but it depends upon what you'd like. I, some people, you may want to watch the wind. Some people live in areas where the wind is constantly 20 miles an hour. You know, I don't like that for myself. So check the climate. Is it conducive to who you are, where you're presently at? And you'll find in some places, like in the United States, some some areas are a lot less expensive uh, to go to, and other places are much more expensive. And a lot of places that are less expensive don't have as good as season. You decide what your pocketbook and what God calls you to. Because I believe God wants people spread all throughout the world in all kinds of locations, in cornfields and farm fields and ranches and wilderness and all kinds of places because God wants his people to be an influence upon worldly people to bring them into the kingdom. And so we're not all gonna just go to the mountains or just go to the woods. We're gonna be located in different places. Uh, the fifth thing is air. The air you breathe is very important to me. When, I, when I'm flying into like Los Angeles or Washington DC or New York, 
I mean, I look out the airplane, I can just see this, this disgusting smog sitting over the city. That air affects the health of yourself, uh, especially uh, our lungs. We're breathing that in on a constant basis. So you want a place that has pure, fresh air, wholesome air, unpolluted. Uh, even You can even go to the mountains if like in Missoula, Montana, it's a beautiful location, but there's mountains all around it. So it gets in an inversion in an area that should be loaded with fresh air. A lot of times gets in an inversion. So even though you may be in a place that generally has good fresh air, if it gets inverted, it can smog it down. So the air we breathe is part of our life. I mean, the reason I hike and I walk so much is that I, I'm always taking in huge amounts of oxygen, uh, keep my lungs healthy, keep me healthy, vitally important to us. Uh, so check out the air. And big cities are contaminated, not just with the air, but they're contaminated with the lifestyle that they have. You want to make sure that your property is accessible, that you can get to it. The property that I have, I'm 12 minutes from a small airport right now. I can get in and out and because we fly, we speak in different places. The last place that we owned, we were an hour and a half from an airport, 50 miles up a gravel road full of chuck holes. I mean, um, didn't bother me in the least. To me, that was like an insurance policy, kept the world out. And that allowed us to raise our children in environment. But once we had our children raised, uh, we didn't need that anymore. So we we moved on to what the next place was for us. So don't be afraid that to get a place that's maybe less accessible now, but maybe down the road, God will ask you to sell it and move to a different location. So accessibility is very important to you. Uh, the location where you live is very important. In other words, I've always tried to find a property that... Uh, <clears throat> was somewhat secluded. In other words, I didn't have a lot of homes around me. People can't see me. They can't see what I'm doing. They can't see when I'm coming and when I'm going. I've always tried to get a home that was backed into the government property. So my neighbor would never, it could not be developed because I want privacy. I don't want people seeing me, seeing what I'm doing, invading my privacy, reporting me, things of that nature. So so privacy is very important if you can find it. When I found that home for that uh, English couple up in Ireland, I mean, we found that cute little derelict and got that fixed up and uh, it, they were surrounded by forest service. There's all trees around them, tall privacy, yet they had a cute little driveway they could get out onto the county, county road and got out very quickly. So it was a lovely little place. Uh, <clears throat> you may want to, Consider if it's self-facing, if you want to put in solar power, or if you want solar, a house that's heated more through the windows. The self-facing is very important. I like hills, I like rolling property. Uh, if you can see my property presently, we sit on this peninsula here and it drops down to our three creeks and we got ravines, we got trees, we got variety. I like variety for myself. Uh, makes me feel like I'm not just sitting on a pancake. So you decide what's attractive to you. Uh, our present home has total solar potential. I mean, we face south and there's nothing that obstructs uh, the sun. So we can put in a complete solar system and we don't even need the power company. Uh, some places when you go out in the country, uh, like in, in the United States, like Minnesota's loaded with mosquitoes. I don't like mosquitoes. I don't like ticks, they give Lyme disease. So to me, it was very important that I always found a location where, because I like to be outside so much, it, it doesn't, it has a drier climate. I know you don't in Ireland, <laughs> but for me, I don't like mosquitoes. I don't like ticks. I don't like Lyme disease and things of that nature. So I've always isolated myself from those kinds of things. Uh, look at what the general weather is for you. I mean, my boys love the snow. I used to love the snow, but I don't like the snow anymore because they downhill ski, they cross country ski, and they can do that right out of their house for at least cross country skiing. 
uh, I, now I drive to the ski resort to go downhill skiing, but uh, you decide what works well for you. Uh, just remember that you want general weather that meets your needs for who you are, for your age, for your personality, for your family. So put that on your checklist. And for me, where I moved, we didn't even have a phone for three years. Or there was no phone line for 50 miles. It would have cost a million and a half dollars for a phone. That was one of the biggest benefits we ever had. Because that, that cut off that cut off all that, that nonsense. If, if I need to know, people could get the information to me. But people waste so much time on the telephone. Of course, today we get all these iPhones and you can, they can catch me when I'm climbing up a 14,000 foot peak. I think that's disgusting. <laughs> I don't like to be that available to people today. So look at your location. Does it give you good solar power? Does it have hydropower potential? Does it have too much wind? Can you get phone access so you can uh, uh, carry on your business? Um, those are very important aspects. And another, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, number eight is nature. To me, it was very important that we had the ministry of nature around us. Uh, I mean, I showed you the pictures of, we had the bears in our yard, we had deer, we had, my boys had uh, rabbits. Here, here I have a picture. The boys took into our home pet squirrels, pet rabbits. Um, you can see them with, I mean, our boys, because they didn't have a lot of interaction with other youth. In fact, they had very little interaction with other youth. Here's some of our deer. I don't know if you can see these well. You'll see me laying with one of our, our deer. These are all wild deer. Uh, we tamed them by making friends with them. We planted our whole yard to clover. So they come in there and then we put out cracked corn for them. Then the mothers would bring us their babies and the fawns would grow up with my boys. And you can see, I think, you can see them petting the deer right here. You see me laying with them. You can see these big bucks right on our front yard. Uh, ministry of nature is very important to children when they're growing up. If you take your children, which we did from association with other children, people thought they would be desocialized, but they aren't. Children are never socialized well by other people's children. They're socialized best by spiritual adults. But if you're gonna take from your children, you gotta to give to them. So we gave them the biggest playground in the world. They had pet deer, pet bear, they had pet rabbits, they had pet, pet squirrels, they had pet, I mean, they love nature and nature is God's second book. It speaks to us. God's first book is his holy word, but the second book is nature. So the ministries of nature were very important to us. The birds, the, we had birds would walk outside and we could, They'd come to our, right into our hands and they'd feed right out of our hands. It was beautiful. We had a fox. We'd be sitting outside and he'd come right up to us and we'd feed him right out of our hands. You know, just children just really tune into that type of thing. So it's a good replacement principle. So if you're going to take from your children, they're going to be more isolated from their friends. You've got to give something better in return. And what you give them better in return is you with time with them in the ministry of nature. And I could say to my children, yes, you can go cross country skiing. Yes, you can go kayaking. Yes, you can go caving. Yes, you can go uh, downhill skiing. Yes, you can go uh, uh, track that moose down or whatever. Uh, yes, you can go mountain biking. Yes, you can go backpacking. So my boys were never bored because they had us in the ministry of nature. And they grew up strong characters without a lot of other youth. And now they're the leaders in their churches. People said they'd be desocialized. They weren't. They were just the opposite. They were strong in character. And now they're able to bring that character into the other, the churches that they belong to. So number nine is government. Government is a big interferer in our lives today. It is a thorn in our side. And so different counties, different states, different countries, different locations have different restrictions, 
different regulations, different permits. If I lived in California, the cost of just getting a permit to build a home is like $25,000. Where I'm in, in Colorado, Montana, there's hardly no permits. You have to get a, a septic permit and a building permit. That's it. A couple hundred dollars. So government has become very intrusive into our lives today. So try to pick out the county that you live in. Different counties have, have different restrictions and different regulations, different building codes. When we lived up in Montana, there was absolutely no building codes. You could build whatever you want. If you live down close to San Francisco, they got all kinds of codes and the expense that you've got to go through is incredible. So government's very important for us. Uh, homeschooling was very important. We wanted to live in a state that allowed homeschooling, where some states didn't allow it back then. So some states have very low taxes. Uh, the other states are very highly taxed states. So look at where you're moving to and see if it fits the regulations and the codes and the taxes that you can afford and try to maneuver that the best that you can for who you are. And the last area is employment. Uh, make sure that I, I see people that they have a real good skill set, but that skill set doesn't allow them to move any place. In other words, you have to, where you move, you have to make sure you can uh, support your family, that you can have decent employment. And if maybe you're making $50 an hour or $100 an hour now, and you move to a location where you can only make $15 an hour, you may not be able to support your family. So employment, can you make a living to where you're, you're, you're moving to? Can, will it meet your needs? When, when we moved to the wilderness, people said, Jim, you're crazy. You know, you can't make a living up there. You're up in the wilderness. There's no way you can make a living. And I knew that, but I knew God was calling us to it. And so we had, uh, after we sold everything, we bought our property and uh, we had $18,000 left. We divided it by three. We said, we'll live on $6,000 a year for three years. And then we'll see what God does. And that was kind of stupid. It's kind of crazy, but that's what God called us to. And God really blessed. Well, in that last year, I didn't know how I was, I was gonna get any money and we we're living on barely anything. And the man that showed us real estate called, uh, didn't call me, we met him in town. And he says, Jim, why don't you work for me? And I said, I'm not interested in working for you. You know, he said, well, don't you need employment up there? I says, yeah, I'm gonna need employment. I, I don't wanna, I don't wanna sell real estate. He said, well, Jim, you need to come and see me. Well, I told him no. And then he sent me a letter and he says, you, you tell me what you need and I'll provide it. So I went down to his office and I said, well, I have no requirements from your office. You pay all my real estate dues. You provide me a desk when I come down to town. I don't have to attend any meetings. Uh, you provide me with a radio phone. They didn't have cell phones then. And I said, uh, then I'll consider. Well, I thought he'd tell me to leave. And he said, okay, what else you need? And I said, Lord, is, is this from you? And it was God. And so God led me into real estate practice. And I still started selling wilderness property to the Rockefellers, multi-million dollar properties. Now I'm living out of my home in the wilderness. I'm making tons of money selling out of my home, working three days a week. God provided for me. So if he provided for me, he'll provide for you if you know he's leading you. So we're told in the book of edu education, page 267, the specific place in life is determined by our capabilities. So know what your capabilities are, know what if God is leading you and plan accordingly. So let's take a look. Those are the 10 things. Not everybody's gonna get all of those perfectly. That's why I say the perfect 10 minus two. Maybe it's minus three for you, I don't know. Right now the home the property we live in is probably the nine and three quarters. You know, the last home we had was probably a nine, it wasn't a perfect 10. So you may have to give up something. So let me just give you some quick real estate advice. If you're looking for property, uh, zoning restrictions are very important. Can your land be zoned for what you're gonna do? 
you may buy a home, but it may be zoned that you can't have a, a home business out of it, or maybe you can't subdivide it. You, you want to take a look at the zoning restrictions for where you're moving. And if there's regulations that are going to control what you want to do or not do. Uh, also, you want to take a look at covenants. When I bought this 30 acres, it had covenants because it, it, it used to be a larger piece of property. And the farmer cut it off because the farming property he wanted to sell. And this had a building site, but there's covenants so that the other, on the other properties, they can only build a certain size home, certain kinds of colors, certain restrictions. So all those covenants, covenants were favorable to me because if people in the surrounding area sell off their farming land, there's covenants with that land that will protect me. But covenants can be negative too. They can restrict you too much. So you want to take a look at whatever the covenants may or may not be on the property. They may be positive to you. They may be negative to you, but look into the covenants. Then also find out if you own the mineral rights. Um, where we're at, there's a lot of oil in Colorado. <clears throat> and some of your properties have sold off the mineral rights. In other words, they could come in and put a, a well on your property someday, an oil well, because they own the mineral rights or they might own the timber rights. So you may own the actual piece of property itself, but somebody else might own the mineral rights, be able to put an oil well, may be able to take the timber off from it. They may own the, the water rights. So you want to make sure that you own the rights on your property as, as reasonable as possible because you could be intruded upon. You could build a beautiful place. They stick up an oil well right next to you. No, not interested in that. So check into your, your middle rights on the property and you want to make sure you get a warranty deed. There's different kinds of deeds to your property and some deeds are, are, are stronger ownership than others. So the best deed, at least in America, the term for it is a warranty deed that you want to make sure that it's clear title that you own everything, that there's the, that, that the chain of ownership has been followed all the way through. And I'll tell you how to do this very simply in a little bit. I sold a piece of property, so the man, it wasn't surveyed. It, uh, it was bored by the Forest Service. And I told the gentleman, I said, you need to have it surveyed because the four corners are in. He says, well, the, I see where the Forest Service corners where they logged and everything. And I, I think I'm all right. I says, you never trust that. You make sure that it's surveyed. Make sure when you buy a piece of property, you're, you've got the survey pins there and you know that's your property. Well, he didn't do it. And he built his house 10 feet onto the Forest Service. <laughs> Not very intelligent. <laughs> that cost him a lot of money, a lot of problems. You wanna make sure that you're assured of your boundaries and you know exactly where your acreage lies and doesn't lie. So a lot of what I told you is very simple by in the United States, we can buy what's called title insurance. You go to a title company and they research all the covenants, they research the mineral rights, they research the warranty deed, zoning restrictions. And then you can, you can order preliminary title policy, it doesn't cost you anything that shows you if there's any hindrances to your property. And then if you buy the property, you pay for the warranty deed, I mean, for the title insurance. So there's companies out there that will do all that research for you. And then they will ensure you that if anything comes up that's a surprise in the future, that they will cover the cost of that for you. And that's called title insurance. And uh, they search for liens against the property, for covenants, back taxes, make sure that the property has legal access to it, uh, whether you own the mineral rights or not. So a title insurance policy is vitally important today. I would not buy a piece of property if I could not get title insurance on it. We've already talked about water rights. If you're buying a raw piece of property and you haven't built on it, you wanna make sure that you can get sanitation approval. So that's a, a septic system so that uh, some land, if it has too much moisture in it, you may own the land, but they may not allow you to put a home on it with a septic system because it could taint the water supply. So if you're buying a piece of rural property, you want to subject it 
to sanitation approval, you may also want to substitute it. I just had a friend and you're going to buy a piece of property. He's a doctor that retired and he's moving to the area that we're in. And he found a piece of property, he wanted me to look at it. And I looked at it and I said, I don't feel good about this property. I, I think you may not be able to get a well. So we visited all the neighbors and three of the neighbors couldn't even get a well. They drilled three or four wells and they weren't able to get a well. And uh, so you need to research the neighboring properties. If you haven't drilled a well, at least where we live, you can go to the county, you can look up where all the wells are and aren't. When we talked to the neighbors, a lot of people were hauling their water in. He didn't know that. So I said, if you're gonna buy this piece of property, I told him I would not buy it, but I said, if you're gonna insist on buying it, uh, then insist that you put a clause in that you've that you reach groundwater within 150 feet with a minimum of five gallons a minute. That's what you need minimum to run a household. And if you don't hit that, you don't buy the property. And if you don't get septic approval, you don't buy it. So you may want to protect yourself before you buy that property. I had a friend that bought a piece of property. He didn't do that. He drilled six wells, never got water, six wells. You know what it cost to drill a well? I mean, he had thousands and thousands of dollars into empty wells. So the other thing to make sure is that you have access. So if you're going across government property or other people's property, you wanna make sure you have deeded access to your property. So I'm gonna leave you with this last thought. And it's a biblical thought, it's in Proverbs 21, 31. Then we'll, then we'll take a few more questions. It says the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but the safety is of the Lord. So a lot of people, I've seen a lot of people because of the end times were in there building what they call their ark of safety. And so they put all their focus into the physical structure, but we're told that the safety is of the Lord. When, when Noah built the ark, it was his character they got him permission to enter the ark. And without the character, the ark would have done him no saving good. And your country property will do you no saving good if you just focus on the physical aspect of it. And men are very, very big into this. You know, I can got my solar power, I got, and I'm happy for them. Got my gardens, but it's like they don't even need God. So remember, the horse is prepared against the day of battle but the safety is still of God. We have to be totally and completely dependent upon God. Our country properties are only an aid to shield the world from us, build our characters, give us a quiet life so we have a walk with God, so we can go off from our country properties, reach the world with what's changed us, because what changed us will change them. That's true evangelism. So I'll take any questions at this point. Okay, Jim, before, uh, before the questions here, I have one comment from, from a guy actually in Brazil here. Uh, he wrote, um, it, uh, greetings to all of you, you know, and just to, to be know that the experience you and your family been through was an inspiration for endless and endless families throughout the world. So because of what you guys did, we are now living in the country. We have a family and we are serving the Lord. So praise the Lord for that. I'd like to comment on that and thank that brother from Brazil. You know, we've been in over 20 countries around the world. You know, I'm, I'm a little disturbed with the kind of evangelism that goes on in the churches today where they take some expert, bring them into the church. And I'm not against the person. I have friends that are evangelists. And then they, they do, they reach the community and then they leave and then the people are left. And that to me is not really evangelism. You know, the evangelism that God wants, I'm all for evangelism, but the evangelism God wants is you. He wants your family to live it. And so when other families see you and they see your marriage and they see your family, they want what you have. They, God wants your life to affect other people's families around. And you're supposed to be the evangelism for the church. We shouldn't have to bring in special evangelists. 
we are supposed to be the evangelist tool that God uses because we live the way God lives. We believe the way God has called us to God. When God people meet you, they ought to be able to say, boy, what is it about those people that's so special? And they want what you have. Today, I've brought in new, many new people to our local church. One was a guy that I got a massage from. Another one's an insurance agent. Another one was a Presbyterian. Another one was from Assembly of God. These are all people we met. And through our association with other people, we then invite them to our churches. We don't have to have an evangelist. We are the evangelistic tool. And God wants to use you as an evangelistic tool. That's the first angel's message, a demonstration that God lives in me and my marriage and my family. So praise that brother from, from Brazil saying that our life has influence and it has, not because of us, but because of God working in and through us. And that's all country living is about. God wants to work in and through you. Amen. Thank you, Jim. There's another question here. I'll try to, it's a little bit complicated to read, but I will. I, my question is, I do understand that we need to go country style in many ways for the benefit of ourselves in general. Now, what would be the main thing for us to do to our neighbor while living in the country? It's spiritually saying, the reason why I do ask I do ask you this is because I do see a lot of people going country in a very selfish proportion. How should we harmonize our spirituality among others, uh, our family, relatives, friends, college, outside of our, the safety of our home? Excellent question. It's very simple. This is a rule that Sally and I have lived by and we live by it today and, and our lives continue to to touch other people's lives all around us, even to, to today in our local community. This is the rule. Uh, I've actually found in ministry healing, I'm trying to think of the page, but so whoever I meet, there's four principles that I live by. I first try to meet, uh, first I care for that person. Then I try to discover their need. Then I minister their need. Then I introduce them to Jesus Christ. That's all you got to do. It's that simple. You care for the person. So whoever it is, if it's a family member, if it's a neighbor, if it's an employee or whatever, care for them. Everybody has some that you can care for them for. Then you discover what their real need is. You minister to that need, and then you bring them to Jesus Christ. Let me give you a very quick example of that. Because uh, I want to go down. I love the downhill ski in the winter. It's getting too expensive. It's getting out of hand. And uh, I was at a gathering in Telluride, Colorado. That's where one of the world's greatest ski resorts is. And I was talking to one of the uh, managers there and I was telling him, I'd, I'd love to get a year pass here, but it, it's too expensive. I think it was like $1,600 a year. And I, I, can't, I, I, I can't justify that kind of money for downhill skiing. He says, I'll tell you what. He says, well, I'd like you to be a chauffeur for us. In the winter, if you drive one day a week, uh, we'll pay you $15 an hour. You'll get tips, but you'll get a free uh, yearly pass to tell you right. And I said, sounds good. So I took him up on it. Well, the people that I chauffeur for all own multi-million dollar homes. I mean, 10,000 square foot homes, $20 million, very, very expensive place. So I'm dragging up my cute little chauffeur hat on and I'm just a little chauffeur for all they know. And I drive up to this mansion, great big place. And I, I, I get out of my vehicle and I go up to the door and the people open the door and the woman's standing there and she just looks distraught. I mean, she just looks like she was just was going to die. And I said, ma'am, can I carry your skis for you? And I said, are you all right? And I'm caring for her. Okay. So I'm carrying their skis. I put them in the vehicle, which is really their responsibility, to be honest with you. And I said, man, are you all right? Because you, you don't look good. And she says, no, I'm not all right. And I said, why is that? And she says, well, last year when I was on the ski hill, <clears throat> someone broadsided me. I ended up in an intensive care unit for two months in the hospital. She says, this is my first day back on the ski hill. And this woman's in her 70s. And she says, I'm scared to death. Beautiful. 
So I'm caring for her. Now I know what her need is, right? She is scared to death to go skiing. So I get him in the vehicle and I've got the rear view mirror up and I'm looking in the mirror. I'm looking at her husband and her husband's just rolling his eyes like, what is this chauffeur going to do with my wife? You know, I've been trying to straighten her out for 70 years. You know, you could just see the whole scenario. So I'm praying to God because my connection, my wisdom is never myself. My connection is always with God. It's always, Lord, what would thou have me to do? Lord, what would thou have me to say? Well, how do you want me to minister to this person? Because we're not in this world for ourselves. We're in this world for other people once we find the connection with God. So I says, ma'am, you're scared, aren't you? And she says, yes, I'm scared. And I said, you're thinking you're going to get clobbered on the ski hill. Yes. And I said, the Olympics, Winter Olympics are going on right now. If a downhill skier that was going for the gold medal was thinking, I'm going to fall, I'm going to fall, I'm going to fall, I'm going to fall, what's going to happen? She says, well, he's going to fall. I says, precisely. So I said, we have to change your thinking. And now her husband's looking. I mean, I'm, I'm watching him in the room here. Me and her husband's going like, oh, my. I've been trying to th change this woman's thinking for, you know, all our married lives. So I said, so we have to substitute your negative thoughts with positive thoughts. And now her husband's listening. And I said, so we're, we're going to have to change your thought pattern. But I said, you don't have the power to do that. I said, you have built up a habit pattern of always thinking negative. And her husband's going, like, yeah, she sure is. You know? And I said, so I want to introduce you to a power that can aid you today in your negative thinking. And that power is Jesus Christ. She said, well, I'm not a Christian. I said, you don't have to be a Christian. I says, my Jesus is no respecter of persons. He lives for everybody. And though you don't even profess him, he'll be there for you today. Can I tell you how to connect with my Jesus? And her husband's, I mean, he's, he's like all ears now. And so now we're at the, at the ski uh, um, hill. And I said, I turned around and I, I discussed with her what grace was very quickly. I told her grace is God's presence with you. You don't deserve it. He says that he'll save you. What he'll do is he'll affect new thoughts in your mind. And when you sense those new thoughts coming, if you'll think on those and then replace them with, with the old thoughts, God will give you a freedom today that you've never had before. And so I explained to her how that'll happen. It'll be not, not an audible, but God will impress you with positive thoughts, not negative thoughts. And that's Jesus. That's my Jesus working for your benefit. And as you surrender to those positive thoughts, if you cooperate with those positive thoughts, God will give you freedom over your emotions, your feelings, because your emotions, your feelings are controlling her. Her husband's going, like, yeah, I sure know that one. And she says, really? Your Jesus will be there for me? I said, yeah, you won't be able to see him. You won't be able to touch him, but you'll be able to sense his presence. And at the end of the day, I'll pick you up and see how it went. And so she had a beautiful day skiing. I picked her up and I brought with her, I always carry with me books. So I gave her one of my books, Escape to God. It's how to have a personal living experience with God every day. It's been translated into over 30 languages around the world. That's how a lot of you people know us. And she took the book, she read it. I took her to the ski hill two weeks later and she was, she was, she was connecting with my God. Why? because I had a demonstration in my life. That's the first angel's message, is demonstrate that you belong to God. Demonstrate that you care for people. Demonstrate that you have the ability to discover their need. And her need was an emotional need. And my Jesus is the answer to everybody's need. I know that. I know that wherever I go, when, when I was on the massage table and I'd, I'd fallen on the ski, I went to a massage specialist and it was 13 year old uh, young man and he's, he's massaging me and I'm talking to him. Well, he had a need and he was rejected by his church. And so I took him in he's been a friend of mine for two years. He's attending our church now. He had a need. I met that need while he was meeting my need. So the person's question is answered very simply. You, not me, you are the best evangelistic tool God has. And that tool, if you understand how to use your experience, who you are, all you have to do is care for people. It's not hard. Open the door for them, carry their skis out, ask them how they're doing, 
discover what their need is, meet that need, and then introduce them to Jesus Christ. That's it. And if our church would do that, the work would be finished in three years. Done. Over with. We wouldn't need evangelists because you're the evangelist. That's how it's done. That's what, that's what Sal and I do. Every day, Sal and I pray, Lord, allow our life to touch somebody else's life. May we not just live for ourselves. May we live for other people. And God always answers that prayer. And he'll do it. You don't have to have the wisdom or the understanding that Sal and I do or the skill set. God will use who you are or who you aren't to reach who you can't that I can't. So don't worry about your skill set. God will bring the people that you presently can reach. Amen. Thank you. I have a, a very good friend of mine in, who lives in Belize. And uh, we spoke on the phone a few a weeks ago, and he told me that his prayer is very similar to what you say. He said, Lord, take away the management of my life because I cannot manage. You know, and that's, that's so true. That's so true. So there's three questions here that I try to make in one. Uh, basically, it's, uh, people trying to move. They, they are convicted. They need to move. Uh, they are afraid of the job part. They are concerned because it's too far or they will not be able to find a job. And if they are able to find a job would be something uh, they are not familiar with and they may struggle financially. What, what can you suggest or do you have any, any examples to give about it? Yeah, uh, we've met all kinds. We've helped hundreds of people move to the country. And um, it's scary for a lot of people. It really is. Let me give you one example, one very difficult example, maybe two, if you, people need it. Uh, we had a person, uh, they lived in North Dakota. They read one of our books. They called and said, can we come over and, and uh, see how you're living and see your place? So they were driving over and they stopped at a place uh, on Sabbath and they met some other Adventists at the Adventist church. And they, this particular Adventist man invited him to his home. He didn't, he was an older man. He, he didn't know that he owned 600 acres. Nice old boy. Anyways, he sent them up to our place up in the wilderness. And they got up to our place. and They were saying, I, it won't work for us. It, we, have, we don't have the skill set. I'm a very simple person. I don't have hardly any skills at all. We really don't have much money. Uh, it, it just isn't going to work for us. I, I hear you, they stayed with us three days. This is on the last day. Well, the gentleman whose home they stayed at called me on our radio phone at the time. We had a radio phone. And he said, uh, Jim, is that family there that... Uh, uh, stopped at our home. I said, yes. He says, well, I've been impressed over the last three days that I should give him 20 acres of land. <laughs> Would you tell me that? <laughs> so I went back and I, I looked at the, the couple and I said, now you're sure that God can't work for you. You, it, Nothing will work out. You don't have the skill set. You don't have the money. Yeah, I'm absolutely sure God, God could do it for you, Jim. You were a businessman. You had skills. You had some funds to come to the country with, but God God, God, God can't, can't work for us. So I said, so I told them the story. Well, they started crying. They went down, they got the land. And a couple of weeks later, they called me and said, Jim, we, we got to go back to North Dakota. I said, why is that? And he said, well, we don't have a job. And I said, well, what do you mean you don't have a job? Well, <clears throat> uh, we got the land, but we can't work. And I said, well, what did you used to do? And so uh, uh, I directed them to a, a, a sawmill. And he went and got a job at the sawmill. And he was working at the sawmill. And now he gets some funds coming in. So they put a little camper on the property. And then they called me up and said, Jim, can we come and talk to you? We got to go back to the Dakotas. <laughs> I said, what's up? So he comes back and he says, uh, I hurt my back. And I, I, can't, I can't work anymore. I was lifting too big a piece of lumber. And, and now I, my back gave out. And that was one of my assets. And I said, do you think that God doesn't have another plan for you? You're going to go run back to North Dakota? He says, yes. And I said, well, pray about it. You know, don't do that. So <clears throat> what had happened was his sister lived in Alaska, and her husband was killed in an oil rig accident, and she inherited a large sum of money. And his mother was telling his sister the story 
So his sister called him up and said, I'll provide the funds for the building if you'll build it. So now, so now he's got the money. Now he's building the home. And then he comes and he says, well, now we got to go back. We got a home. We got a piece of land, but I can't get any employment. <laughs> and I said, so you think God doesn't have a plan for you? You're going to run back to North Dakota? He says, yeah, Jim, I, I'm sorry that you think I don't have much faith, but uh, we got to leave. And I said, well, why don't you pray on it? Is there anything that you did? And he said, yeah, I used to work at a self-supporting institution at UG Pines. I used to run a, a vegetarian restaurant. I've always wanted to own a, and it had a health food store. I was very successful in managing I said, well, go down to the health food store, see if you can buy it. And he said, well, that's stupid, Jim. I said, well, you got to start someplace. So he goes down by the health food store and he's just hanging out in this health food store for like an hour and a half. And the owner notices this guy just shuffling around and goes up to him. And he didn't know that the owner was a Christian and the owner had been praying, Lord, I want to sell the place, but I can't advertise it because I don't want to lose business. Please send the next owner to me. So he you know, goes up to my friend and says, can I help you? And he's kind of like a horse pawn at the ground. Well, gee, yeah, let me tell you my story. And said, well, praise God. I've been looking for someone to buy the place. I'll sell it to you. So then Bruce calls me up and comes up and says, uh, Jim, I, I, even they're going to sell to, I, I can't do it. I don't have the money. I said, <laughs> Do, do you believe in God or don't you believe in God? So I said, what about that sister that had that money? Maybe she would be a silent partner. So he went and asked her and she became a silent partner, bought the health food store until he could pay it off. So now here's a guy that said, God can't work for me. I don't have any skills. He's got 20 acres of land with a creek coming through with a house all paid for and his own health food business. And you're going to tell me God's not going to work for you or doesn't have an ability to work for you or you're afraid. I was afraid. I was scared to death. When I left a thriving insurance practice, I was making, I had a six figure income. So in my early thirties, I had a great big, beautiful home, five beautiful cars. I had to walk away from it all. Go up in the wilderness. I was scared to death. My wife wasn't. She just knew that God would work for me. I, I was scared to death, but God's worked for my life. He worked for this couple. Let me tell you one other story. This is one that I didn't think the person should move to the country. I mean, the person, I did a, a, a series down by Chicago, Illinois, and this uh, gentleman, Eddie's name is, he comes up to me after the meeting. He says, Master Holmberger. He was very slow. He says, I'm going to move to the wilderness like you. And I said, Eddie, I, I, you know, this is a man that doesn't have much skill set. I'm not downing him. I'm just trying to relate to you the story. And I said, are you married? He says, yes. His wife, his one daughter. I'm going to move to the wilderness of Idaho. And I'm going like, what do you do for a living? He's I'm a janitor. He sweeps floors at an auto body shop. And that's his only skill set. And he's inspired by God. <laughs> he's going to move to the wilderness. I'm going like, oh, Lord, help me. I mean, I said, Eddie, are you sure you should do this? Because I'm looking at it and I'm thinking that I'm going to help this guy ruin his life. And he was convinced that God was going to work for him. So I tried to talk him out of it, tell you the truth. So he's, he moves to Idaho with his little camper and his wife, and he buys this piece of property. He's got to hike into it. Can't, doesn't even have a road into it. <clears throat> Can't get a job. Uh, he's down at a local grocery store telling somebody about it. And they said, well, there's this big guy that has his horse ranch down the road, and he's looking for somebody to shovel out the manure. Would you do, be willing to do that? It only pays minimum wage. So he did. So he's making minimum wage, shoving out the manure in horse stalls. And the manager of the place noticed that the man had an unusual connection with these huge Clydesdale horses. And the animals just related to him. And the owner wanted his 
uh, acreage. I think he owned like a thousand acres of land horse logged. He didn't want tractors in there churning up the soil. He wanted horse log, but he couldn't find a horse logger. But the manager of the place noticed that this gentleman had an unusual connection with these horses. So they made a proposal to him, would he be willing to log the property with the owner's horses? Well, that paid a lot of money. And he became a professional horse logger. <laughs> the guy that could even talk could only be a janitor. God provided an opportunity for him. He wasn't even scared. I was scared for him. So I understand what you're wrestling with. And God hardly ever allows any of us ever to step out unless it's faith. He doesn't resolve every issue. He doesn't take away every hindrance. He wants you dependent on him. So you don't get the credit. So Jim Holmberger doesn't get the credit. So the credit goes to God and God only. So yes, you're going to have some areas that you're going to really wrestle with. But the bottom line, when God was asked me to sell that prosperous business and that big, beautiful home, 40 park acres, even though I was scared to death, I had an inward sense that I knew there was a better way of life. I couldn't have told you everything I can tell you now, but I just had an inner calling to my heart saying, I want you to come out, Jim. I want you to come out, I want you to be separate, and I want to train you in my school of the wilderness. And I didn't understand all the aspects. I didn't see through all of it at the time. There was a lot of growth that I had through the whole situation, as I told you. Everything went wrong at first because the devil tried to discourage us, but we hung in there with God. So the bottom line is that you and your wife your spouse or whoever you're involved with in this situation, maybe it's a family. When you get down off your knees, you have to know if, if God is calling you or if he isn't. If he is, he's not going to remove every hindrance from you. So it's very obvious. It's going to take a step of faith. Well, well what an answer. What an answer. You know, I think especially the, the men of the house, uh, you know, we, we have a big, big burden upon us because we need to sustain the family. You know, the wife usually is in charge of the kids and the, the house, but the, the father, when he goes to sleep, he's always thinking, how am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to provide for the rent? How am I going to provide for the, the gas of the car and, and so forth? So it, it's about putting the, the feet on the water, isn't it? Like you need to show God that you, you you're willing and willing to let him work in you so jim i don't have enough work words to thank you you know for for all the message you've given us uh i know if we stay here we're going to stay for another five hours uh asking questions and so so uh listen thank you very very much i know you you put some effort in this because you know just the time difference between ourselves and you it's uh, uh, approximately seven hours you know your day is starting our day here is finishing uh was a wonderful 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 sabbath you know to be able to to receive all this this knowledge that doesn't come from you it comes from god you know and mm -hmm. like many people were, were writing here for me you know your testimony the books you wrote it's just a tool that God provided to you, you know, using you like you like a hammer, you know, giving the message to people. And uh, we are so blessed, so blessed. It's a privilege to meet you. Uh, we thank you so much for all you have done, you know, and for continuing in our ministry. And our families reflect all that, you know, because when, especially in Brazil, you know, I'm from Brazil myself, there, there's so many people that still talk about you, you know, oh, I read the book, Escape to God. I, I would like to meet that guy, you know, and when we share, oh, we met Jim. Really? Did you meet Jim? I say, yes. And, and they come with all those questions, you know, and what do you do for a living and, and how were you able to succeed and, and, and so forth. And we just say, listen, keep reading the books because all the knowledge that God has given them, they put on the books. So the books are simply amazing. So I invite each one of you guys here in the meeting to really go to the to the website. You know, if you don't have the website, it's just just Google Jim Hamburger. Uh, you know, empoweredlivingministries.com. And they also have a YouTube channel, you know, with many, many materials there. And um, Jim, 
if you would like to to close with prayer you know and again from all of us from brazil spain lithuania latvia portugal uh, ireland northern ireland uk you name it there, there are so many many countries here you know uh just a big thanks from every single one of us and and thank you for putting this together for us thank you for inviting me and uh that website our website is empowered living ministries.org if you go there uh, our youtube channel there's i don't know three dozen four dozen videos that'll all free all free that'll help you a lot of free free stuff there so if we can help in any way you can email me to jim at empowered living ministries.org so just take our ministry and then it's just an email jim at because we're here to help you we're not here for ourselves we're here to do God's work and God's work involves helping people on the journey that they are at. It's like I told you, it's meeting your needs. It's not meeting my needs. Jesus came to this world to meet your needs. So that's what true Christianity is about. So let's have a word of prayer. If you have any questions you want to email me on, it will be, or my wife. So if you want my wife, it would just be Sally at empoweredlivingministries.org versus myself. And we'll try to facilitate your walk with God. That's Because if, if you're coming closer to God, we're happier. That's all we want to accomplish. So Father in heaven, you are our God and we are your people. And you are all calling us to a much holier, higher life than we've ever experienced before. Country living is simply a tool in that process. It's simply an aid to put us away from the distractions of the world, the diseases, the dysfunctions of this world, so that we can have un un uninterrupted time with you, so that we can truly become the wise virgins that you call us to and no longer be foolish virgins. We can have that truly born again experience so that our lives then can be used as tools, as instruments to evangelize not only our our neighbors, our families, our, our own churches, but the world. So bless each person here now that they will hear your still small voice. They will know the next step that you're calling them to. May you bless each of them in their journey with you is our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. 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 And I finish you with, with the final comment I hear I think was the best. This was the best ever presentation about country living that we ever had. And there was quite a few questions about if we recorded. Yes, we recorded. If you guys give me a day or two, we're going to post on uh, YouTube. You know, so the same uh, information you got, how to log into this meeting. There is a, there's a channel there on YouTube. It's called 8 a day ministry. So we're going to post the video for this meeting there. So Jim, a warm, warm welcome, you know, from, from all of us. Thank you so much. We wish you could come in an in airplane and visit us here, but I know we can't. So God bless you. And like I say, we, we will talk more, you know, if not here in heaven for sure. God bless you and God bless Sally. God bless you too. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.